Okay. Hey, first of all, thanks a lot for coming on. I, I appreciate it. I we linked up. Uh, I think via LinkedIn or something. I I don't know. Your your name has always been out there. Like, but I don't. I can't remember if you and I have ever interacted in our careers. I I, I can't remember if we ever crossed paths or shared any same space or anything. Is it, well, we we where where were you um, stationed? I was uh, a DM when I first came in, and then went to Germany, Korea, and then uh, Benning. Excuse me, so, Korea, Germany, then Benning. It, it could have been Benning, but it could have been downrange too. Uh, so, yeah. um, I mean, I, I it's a small community, as you know, but doesn't mean we all know yeah. everybody, but you get around a bunch of people, and, and I'm talking about this guy, and you're like, I haven't seen that dude in years, and, and yeah. it, even, you, you know, and it's just, so that, that may be more of it. Uh, maybe, were you at the uh, reunion back in 21 in Nashville? No, I don't think I made that one. Oh, oh. You, you missed a good one. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, they seem I yeah. miss. I was supposed to go to the one that just happened, but uh, I was on the flight out. Actually, I made it to Seattle, and then uh, everybody in my house got sick. So my wife was laid up. And my kids were sick. I'm like, I can't be out there partying while these guys are having a hard time. So I turned around and came back. Uh, but you know what? I do remember that video you were talking about in here, and we'll get to it. That I saw that video, yeah. and somebody, and that's a, I think that's how I uh, I first heard about you was like, you, on that. Uh, and we'll get, like I said, that's awesome. kind of like a tease. We'll get into it a little bit later. But so anyway, yeah. So again, <laughs> right. thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Um, let's let's start from the beginning. You kind, you and I uh, have a similar beginning. We all both came in. when We were seventeen. Uh, so tell me about that. Tell me about you as a, a kid, and then what made you make the decision to come in? And yeah, we'll just go from there. Okay. Uh, well, in a, in a nutshell, uh, I was a pretty unruly kid. I had a I had a, an uncle, great uncle, who was uh, he was an ace in World War II. He was a test pilot for the Air Force. He, he was a squadron commander back in the SAC days. So, and that says it's saying something. And he told me uh, I should go to the Air Force Academy. So I had this goal of going to the Air Force Academy ever since I was, I don't know, seven or eight years old. And uh, I did grow up in small town Waterville, Maine, which is a great place to have been a kid. And it's a great place to be from, but it's also a place you need to get the hell out of or you'll never break gravity, right? Perfect. So, uh, so. I, I didn't get accepted into the academy straight out of high school. I got uh, accepted to do a prep year under the Falcon wow. Foundation Scholarship. Nice. And you could go to a couple different places around the country. You, you had to pick from. I picked New Mexico Military Institute because I was born in New Mexico. I had family in New Mexico, and this seemed like a good fit. Uh, to hedge my bet, I joined Army ROTC at the same time. Uh, so three days after high school, I was off to the ROTC basic camp at, at Fort Knox. Uh, and those are usually you know, juniors in, in college going through that yeah. or just before their junior year. <clears throat> so there I was this, you know, tender little boy of 17. Uh, but I kicked the shit out of all of them. And I, nice. and I, well, except for 31 ahead of me on the order of merit. So that's out of 640 or so cadets in the, in the training battalion. What does that mean? Uh, it means, okay, great. And now I get offered a full, ROTC scholarship, even though the plan is to go to the academy, but you never know. So I took it and uh, I joined the New Mexico uh, Army National Guard uh, under the simultaneous membership program, which was really, it, I mean, it, looking back, it's a scam, right? So I got paid as an E5, even though I was a cadet, didn't know shit yeah. from good apple butter and uh, <laughs> went to drill with all these old crusty Vietnam vets. I mean, we, we, would pack up stuff like we were going to the field and we would just deploy to this other uh, uh, armory in a different town that wasn't drilling that weekend. Yeah. And we'd set all the equipment up and you know, I'd be looking around like, okay, what do we do? And one of the NCOs has uh, the grill going. So it's, uh, it's 10 in the morning. They're like, yep, yep. It's time for lunch. <laughs> and lunch lasted until the next day. <clears throat> so, <Okay>. so <laughs> Yeah. So, so, you know, that was the first of 200. There was an air defense artillery battalion chaparral system. If you've ever heard of it, sure. Yeah. Uh, was obsolete in, in 1990 to say nothing about, uh, you know, what it was still around for. But right. anyway, uh, I did get into the Academy. Uh, and I went, I went there starting in June of 91. Okay. Uh, I left after my third year. I mean, it's still a four year program, but Back in those days, they weren't uh, they weren't taking all the kids that they usually did to pilot training, and there's a trickle down effect. And I didn't want to fly, but uh, you know, obviously, people with a better GPA or military performance average would sit ahead of me and pick jobs. Maybe I I could have lived with, but 
they also, the Air Force, was not taking uh, fresh lieutenants into combat control. There were no 13 Limas at the time. Obviously, there were no Crows. So it was a pretty limited route for a brand new officer. So that's why I chose to leave. I left. <clears throat> I uh, enlisted into uh, the active duty Air Force, went to the OLH down in San Antonio, went through selection for combat control, uh, got hurt. You know, it's a long school. It's a hard school, but um, ended up going to uh, to Herbie and in Hawk 36. And uh, I was in the class with Dave Goggins, with Adam Vesey, uh, Tony Tarando. Trying to remember some of the other Brock Moore was in my class. Uh, Josh Nigella, he was a guard guy, uh, and this other guy Scott Sears. He n- he never made it out of Herbie. He he was invited to do something else with his life. Oh, okay. Uh, but he was he and VZ and I were yeah. We <laughs> uh, if you've been down to Fort Wilton Beach lately, the whiskey barn is still there, and I'm pretty sure I'm still banned. From oh yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's yeah that's 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 me and VZ and, and Sears. You know we would we would go out and. If we couldn't uh, find any women to talk to, we would look for somebody to fight. And if we couldn't find anybody to fight, we would just fight each other. And, <laughs> right. uh, and then invariably, somebody would try to break it up, and we'd get all excited. And we, oh, we'd sharp that guy. So, um, anyway, yeah, you know, misspent you. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I don't want to dwell too much on I mean, you. You went to Herbie. You, you know what that life was like. It's yeah, awesome, yeah. especially as a young oh, guy, yeah. especially going through uh, – I mean, we finished up during spring break time, nice. so you get more free time. Obviously, the scenery improves drastically. Uh, but uh, I got assigned to Fort Lewis and was miserable about it. I, I, I'm not a fan of Washington, yeah. and uh, and I'm here. I'm in Washington right yeah. now, visiting my daughter and and uh, my grandson. But uh, I tried desperately to get out of that assignment. It, it, it just, I mean, guys were going, getting to go to, to uh, Benning, to, to Bragg. They were going straight to, uh, to jump units. And, you know, it's back in the day, right? Not everybody went to jump school. So, right. um, uh, so I ended up at Fort Lewis. Now, here's the thing, right? So uh, I, I, and it's not bragging. I, I crushed the, uh, the schoolhouse. It, it was not, I mean, it's not difficult if, sure. if you, you know, if, you, if you're mentally and physically in shape, you're going to be fine, right? Uh, I was a Commandant Awards winner. I don't know if they still have that or not. Yeah. So, okay. Anyway, so so here I come. I'm I'm at Fort Lewis, and nobody believes that I'm actually just this young, dumb enlisted dude, right? I, the, the the unit, uh, the Fifth ASOS was having some disciplinary problems. Most notably, I think Jason Cherbellini had assaulted a fake tree in the uh, in the day room. SPs have been called. Yeah, well, maybe it was Cesare Di Battista uh, that 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 actually assaulted the tree. But there was a conspiracy to assault further trees, I think, and and it was a it was it was a big whodunit for the SPs on the cord. So, but anyway, here I show up, and they're like, "No way, this guy left the academy. Um, he, you know, just went down to the schoolhouse and walked through the schoolhouse, and he's got to be an OSI plant." <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> that uh, so I mean, right off the bat, they they took me out to Art Boyer took me out to uh, Yakima. I think I'd been in the unit for. Not even well, like a full Monday to Friday, and Friday afternoon we deployed to Yakima for some air. And you know, he hands me the mic, says, "Get, get to it, Airman." I mean, I guess I don't know, you know testing me or whatever, but like, yeah. sure, okay. I mean, you know, I talked to him. It's Harriers, and we had uh, we had the old Aardvarks, the F one elevens back then. Nice. And uh, you know, I mean, I I did fine. It's not like I was great at it. I was brand new, right? But but sure, certainly sure. didn't embarrass myself. Uh, so, you know, that did not dispel any thoughts that maybe, you know, I am from the OSI until there was a big party out in Spanaway. Which I don't, have, you, have you been to Fort Lewis? Have you been to this area? Uh, yeah, a couple of times. I'm, I'm familiar with the area. Yeah. yeah. Never been stationed, but yeah. Yeah. So, so Spanaway's, you know, it's kind of rural, or at least it used to be. Everything's grown up now. But we're out on this, uh, somebody's farm, and there were, it was an all-day party. I forget who had organized it or whatever, but uh, they were raising money for some charity or other. And so uh, paid 20 bucks, I think. And it was all the pulled pork. You know, they had pigs cooking and you, you know, all the pulled pork, all the beer you could drink and five bands and just, you know, kind of a good day. But uh, as the day wore on, people are getting a little bit pretty sauced up. They're having a great time. And uh, 
the people stand and watch and listen to the bands. And, and, and one guy, that, I, I mean, I don't know who this guy is, uh, decides he wants to make this into a mosh pit. And, you know, I don't know really what he was thinking, but uh, I'm pretty sure he wasn't anticipating what came next. And so he uh, sure. started trying to bump into me and I, I kind of pushed him to the ground and he got back up and he was angry and he tried to tackle me. And so I just picked him up and pile drove him into the ground. Uh, and that was, you know, almost the end of the fight. But, you know, following up, he's down. Let's finish him. And I hammer fisted him to the side of the head. And he was totally toast. And apparently I broke his jaw. But I didn't know that at the time. What I did know is, like, I got to go. This whole crowd, I'm looking around. They, they're not happy. I got to go. So right. I start walking. And, uh, it, you know, I, there were cops coming. And it, completely separate, right? But, you know, I'm altered state. So I'm, I'm thinking, oh, they must be coming for me. So I hide in these bull rushes in this little swamp. Cops go by. Sure enough, they go to the party. Um, but it was for a noise complaint, I find out later. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm in, the, I'm in the, the weeds, hiding. Car comes by. It's all the guys, you know, from the fifth. They're hollering out the window. Ox, where are you? Ox, come on. I'm not falling for this, right? <laughs> so I E and E all the way back to McCord. And Spanaway touches the backside of McCord. And so uh, okay. I got over the fence, which, you know, these SPs are pretty good at, at guarding that base. I'm sure. They're better today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I went, I went to the dorms and sitting up on the second stoop was this, uh, was this chick. I don't know what she was in some support job. She was a cutie and, uh, I couldn't get this chick to notice me to save my life. Well, as I'm walking in to go to my room, she sees me, she leans over, she invites me up for a beer. So I'm thinking, Holy crap, this is awesome. I go upstairs. I'm sitting there. I haven't been talking to this girl for 10 minutes. And these two dudes come walking up, right? And they look up and they see her and they see me. And they had come to tell her that her boyfriend was in the hospital with a broken jaw. No way. Small world, right? No They doubt. see me and they're like, oh, that's the guy. Oh, jeez. So, yeah. So, you know. That it was not good. So the you know my first sergeant came the next morning, woke me up, took me down to the SP station. They take me to uh, Pierce County. Pierce County is you know I mean there, there's real crime in Pierce County, right? So uh, the cop looks at me, tells the story. Um, now one of the good things that helped me out was when you went to that party, you had to pay if you weren't going to drink. You got in for free, but you had to sign your name. They had to put your driver's license, all that. Well, yeah. um, Mike Lapidus was our driver. And uh, so he was ostensibly sober, right? I mean, at least the paper says that. And, and he didn't drink. And he was a, right. kind of by the book type of dude. So the cops had interviewed him and he told him the story and matched mine. And he's a sober driver. And so they, they look at each other and, man, they don't, they don't have time for this nonsense. They said, so it sounds like mutual combat. And I said, well, it kind of was. They said, great, get out of here. Which is awesome nice. because, um, you know, they were, they were, tossing around terms like uh, assault two, you know, and I think that's, that's, you know, boom, boom, prison time. So I didn't, I didn't know oh, that. Yeah. But anyway, that cured the unit of thinking that perhaps I was an OSI plan. And after that, well, I, uh, I was just, I, you know, I want to go back. Higgins. What was, you're a big dude. And like, what was that guy? How big was this other guy? Like he, he had have been at least your size to even kind of think that he could miss. Well, he him. was, I he mean, was tall, was but yeah, I mean, it, you know, sometimes people like to take a shot at the title, right? Yeah, they you know, get that liquid it's, courage it's, uh, and, you know. And, yeah, and and, uh, and who knows what this guy was thinking. I mean, I don't, you know, maybe he wanted to mosh and thought he was having fun and, he, you know, he bumps into me and I wasn't having it. And, you know, getting pushed to the ground probably didn't help him. No. So, yeah, I, I mean, but, it, but, but, but no idea what, what the guy was thinking. I know he was probably thinking something else the next day when he had to drink his food for a couple of weeks, but... <laughs> All right. You know, say goodbye so to steak, bully. All those, they quilled all those rumors about oh, yeah, yeah, OSI. Yeah. You yeah. 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 Pretty much. They're like, uh, probably not. Right. So, uh, so I, I stayed at the, I stayed at the fifth. Uh, I, you know, I was fortunate enough that I got out from under the two ID, uh, the big, you know, the big giant badge. It looks like a, a shield and you know, yeah. wraps around the back. It's so big. Ugly, right. um, but I went over to as an as an augmentee over to uh, help out on exercises with second bat and uh, first group. Nice and uh, yeah. So I mean, it, it was because you know they just go and and 
do uh, fun stuff on the you know, downrange. Uh, but I, uh, I was going pretty much TDY to TDY because I didn't want to come back to, uh, to Tacoma. Right? So that was going well until, uh, I don't know, sometime um, we had this guy, Colonel... Colonel Sink was his name. He was our he was our commander, and uh, nobody liked him, right? But we used to do some. I, we loved doing pool PT, where out at one of the, the uh, base gyms, they it was it was shallow enough that that you could stand in it, but you really couldn't um, you couldn't move if you were trying to walk through the pool. But we basically played right. some form of uh, dodgeball, except the idea was to also score we had a little goal or something and you know you're in the pool and it's you're bumping and jostling and you know colonel saint kept getting dunked and you know maybe held under a little bit and i you know this is just the the fog of war of of contact sports but he came up with the idea that i was the person doing that every time which is absolutely not true and there's no way i could have been on him all the time you know but i mean a good portion sure but whatever so the good the uh, the TDY yeah. to TDY good time train that that ended right. So we need another person to go out to Yakima for a month. It's February. Have fun. That wasn't cool. So oh, I uh, yeah. So he wanted me out of there. He passed that on to his replacement, this guy Colonel Fry. So Colonel Fry. Uh, grudgingly he inherited so i i I, uh i had a chance to go to ranger school and i get hurt and uh instead of like letting me heal and then go uh he said well you had your chance so you know i never i never got to go to ranger school which you know yeah i mean and see this is this is why you know i like so airman higgins also made the mistake of believing that in all you know a ranks off shirts off meeting go ahead and air your grievances right so i did i mean i had a list of them you know, let me go through them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Meeting's over. Put your rank back on. Oh, I have, uh, I have oak leaves. And what do you have, Higgins? Not oak leaves. So uh, yeah. I was the, suddenly the number one volunteer for Korea. Uh, so I pulled Jeez. that. And yeah, it wouldn't you know. Hmm, I'm the number yeah. one non-volunteer yeah. for Korea worldwide. Right. Interesting. Uh, <clears throat> and, and I only lucked out of going to Korea because I had to have ankle surgery uh, and, and, it, and it fell apart. Well, there was a chance to go to uh, Kuwait to do a, uh, an Irish gold rotation with fifth group. And I got asked to, to go. So nice. I've been cleared for duty. And 10 days after that, this guy Fry makes me run my PT test, right? Thinking, you know, the ankle's not strong. This guy hasn't been running in months. You know, there's no way he's going to pass this. What he didn't understand is that it's absolutely jackasses like that that compelled me eventually to to get commissioned, right? Sure. Um, obviously, I passed the PT test, right? Um, you know, some vitamin M, walk it off, and and I went to I went to Kuwait. And while I was in Kuwait is when uh, you know a lot of people, a lot of people don't really think about it that uh, Southern Watch that we were doing there was a Southern and Northern Watch yeah. we were flying, and anytime Saddam would raise his head or turn on an emitter or anything they'd bomb it and uh when they couldn't <clears throat> they were coming back and guys like me were out at udari range where Faley was killed um just helping them clear off their racks right so they could land and, and turn and, and you know whatever right. but saddam uh did something right too much or too long or whatever and so they said oh we're, we're going to punish this guy and they started bringing every swing and jumps in camp doha and that's when uh, God, I, don't, I don't remember who they were, but uh, guy uh, Greg Sispaniak, six pack, yeah. he was yep. there. Yep. Uh, uh, Lutz what was Lutz's first name. He showed up. Mark, yeah, Mark. Anyway, Lutz. I mean, so you know, and then Charlie Keebaugh. That's when I met Charlie Keebaugh. Charlie Keebaugh. So we're sitting oh, in the in the day room, and and some some chowderhead captain or whatever was was. You know, I forget where Charlie was from. Maybe he was from Campbell or, or where he was at the time. We're sitting in there, and this captain's kind of a blowhard, and, and he makes a comment just in passing to whoever would listen. That eventually, every river makes a Grand Canyon, and Char- Charlie Keebaugh says, "You're an idiot," you know, from the back of the room. And uh, so, you know, oh, I mean, right? So, so, right? So, the guy says, "You know, who said that?" And Charlie just, you know, just 
one of this guy right here, right? I did. Yeah. And so, uh, and a captain now, I, like, what's he going to do? You chew Charlie right. out. So he said, I'll, I'll, I'll out ruck you. And, you know, just digging the whole buddy. Stop digging. Right. You're, yes. you're not walking out of this one with yeah. your pride intact. Um, but anyway, two things came out of that one, Charlie been a friend since 98. Uh, and two, I realized I didn't want anything to do with being a tag B anymore. These, these officers are absolute clowns. Um, I'm going to go into, because remember I was there doing an Irish gold rotation with, uh, with fifth group as well. And, uh, so I wanted to go into SF. Sure. So when I got back, I had just a couple months left before I ETS'd. And I went over to the, um, to the guard recruiter here in, in Washington and, uh, signed up <clears throat> to have a seamless transition right into alpha company, first battalion, uh, 19th special forces group, which is headquartered in Buckley, Washington, okay. about 40 minutes from here. And I did that. And, uh, I went through, um, you know, all their pre-selection and stuff that that's where I met Evan Hafer, uh, founder okay. of black rifle coffee. Uh, we that? went through together. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, shit, I've known Evan since 98. Uh, but my ex-wife, first ex-wife, right? There's, there's, that's telling. Uh, yeah. We had a baby, a new baby. And she said that uh, if I went through the pipeline, you know, she's taking the kid and going back to Montana and I'm never going to see my daughter again. Yeah. Um, I was young and, and ignorant enough to believe that was possible. So... Uh, I went to the commander of the, of, of the 19th group uh, and he was a, uh, he had graduated from New Mexico military Institute and he knew that I had gone it, Right. So huh. he said, uh, well, yeah, he said, Higgins, I will write a letter of endorsement for you to go anywhere you want to go, but you are not getting out of the military. And I said, why not? And he said, because we need leaders. I said, okay, well, can I go back to the air force? He said, you can go anywhere you want except civilian life. So, okay. So that was Bob Hong. Good guy. Just throwing his name out. Uh, nice. So I went back. So I joined the 116th, uh, which is at Camp Murray, basically across the street from Fort Lewis. Right. And, uh, you know, obviously my wife didn't leave me. Um, <laughs> we did. You know, she is an ex, but uh, uh, matter of fact, good, good story. Right. Like, don't be a dick all the time. Last night I had a party at her house. She threw this big happy hour because I was in town and saw all people I haven't seen forever including Greg Casa, if you know that guy, uh, who was in the 116th, among other units. Okay. His dad, Ed Casa, was a founding member of SEAL Team 1. I haven't seen that guy in wow. 100 years, and he was there. Yeah, wow. so, you know, yeah, so she, she didn't take the kid, and here we are, thirty, almost 30 years later, she's throwing parties for me at the house when I come into town. Well, that's so. Good. Nice. It's kind of a nice, nice Paul Harvey to that story. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah. Right. So, you know, so, uh, so I was at the one sixteenth. uh, you know, was a C was a, was an instructor. Uh, the guards a little different. We get our kids before they go to the schoolhouse. So we try to make sure that, that, that they're prepared, right? We're not going to send somebody down there and they goon it up. And then we look like ass clowns. So, uh, I, they, you know, they, they put me in charge of the new guys and uh, we had a pretty good success rate uh, at that schoolhouse. One kid came back and, you know, he was, I mean, they were all talking about, he was a commandant's award winner. I think he was also number two on the uh, uh, academic, you know, he almost won that. Uh, and so, you know, he's back, right? Hey, this is going to be great. We, uh, we go out and we're going to, they say, Higgins, you gotta, you gotta validate his training. Which just basically meant take him to the woods and smoke his ass. All right. So I said, listen, we're, we're, we're going overnight. You know, this is drill, right? So it's Saturday morning. We're going to be in the field until Sunday afternoon. And uh, I said, get all your stuff and meet me, you know, by the, by the truck in 30 minutes. So he comes out and this, this guy's got like a, a Hello Kitty backpack. I mean, it's just <laughs> tiny, right? You know, my rock is, is loaded, right? I mean, he's got this little, I mean, there's a donut and maybe, you know, a couple tampons in there. Who knows? But there's not much else in there. All right. And so I said, uh, I said, well, let's do a little, uh, let's do a little gear check. He pulls it out. And he's got his wubby and a poncho, but no sleeping bag, no wet weather gear, nothing. Right. Okay. You just came from the schoolhouse, dude. Apparently you were a stud down there. 
uh, this is not going to fly, but I don't say anything. You, hey, let's go. You know you're going out all day, right? All night, and it rains here. It's Washington. Okay, so let's go. So I make sure, knowing that he has no change of clothes and he has no dry stuff and no wet weather protection, that we, we go through the swamps of training areas 9 and 10 on Fort Lewis. Right. And we just live in there all day. And uh, we're, we're sitting there and um, – we, you know, we can hear somebody talking and so, Hey, let's just sneak and peek. Turns out, and maybe you didn't know this, I mean, Fort Lewis being as big and wide open as it is, uh, at least the training areas I mean, there and the meth problem here in, in Pierce County. So there's a dude cooking meth on Fort Lewis and we, you know, get up there and we call back to the unit and, you know, HF and we're, I have them pull the grid and we pass that and we watch as the, uh, the, uh, they weren't well they were mps but i think there was also a you know like a fish and wildlife guy sure and they come up and you know they have a big standoff and arrest this guy oh my god and it's after you know yeah right so it's after this guy you know that's all done and, and we're sitting there and uh he's shivering now because you know he's got no no warm clothes dry clothes right. and he says hey um how, how accurate are those uh are those this test I said, what are you talking about now? Oh, so let me, let me, let me interrupt and go back at this time, because I was in the guard, I had to have a day job, right? So I'm a state trooper here in Washington at the time. And this kid is talking to me and he says, you know, how, how, uh, how accurate are these piss tests? I said, well, they're pretty accurate. Well, you know, I mean, but why? He says, well, I was at a party and, um, you know, I was eating a cookie and somebody laughed and I asked why, what was funny. And they said, oh, those are, those are pot cookies. And I looked at him and I said, well, you know, the threshold for your analysis is pretty high, right? The military. Pretty, so if you ate yeah. one cookie, I mean, how long ago is this? He's like, last night. And I said, okay. Okay. Well, buddy, this cookie had to be the size of Manhattan for, you know, but this guy pissed. So here I am. This guy's, you know, he's the commandant award winner, big feather in our cap as a unit. And his first drill back, he pops hot for, for weed. Which you know, I don't know. So today, maybe they don't care about that. He was probably eating more. Oh, buddy, yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? Like you know, he was he was rooting around in a. I mean, it was like one of those uh, cookie pizzas it had to be. Right? I mean, if he was a, if it was a cookie, but you know, look, <laughs> this guy is smoking dope, and okay. yeah, so whatever. Anyway, so he's done. So I, I realized, like right then, that like this isn't why why keep smoking this kid's bags. I mean, he's gone. Tomorrow we're going to come out of the field and he's going to be captured out. So. I reach into my bag where I have waterproof stuff, pull out my cell phone, which, you know, it was like this big, right? Remember how cell phones were getting smaller and smaller and smaller until they could figure oh, yeah. out you could watch porn on them and then they started getting bigger again. Well, you know, I had this little one. I call, I call D. Batista and I'm like, Deeps, I need an extract from the field. So he rolls up in his beat up red Ford Escort it's somewhere, you know, and uh, we pile into his car throw our stuff in the, in the trunk and off we go to his house. We partied, you know, like all night and came back the next day, uniform on. I mean, this guy got to wash his clothes, get dry, you know, and, uh, and came out of the field at 1130 in the morning. And I said, well, you know, it was good, good working with you, kid. You know, good luck to you. <laughs> Goodbye. All right. Yeah. Um, but you know, all that to say when, when, when the balloon went up, uh, Matter of fact, I, so being a trooper, uh, the guy sitting next to me at Trooper Basic Training is a guy named Jim Hotailing, who you may know the name. He was uh, the command chief for the entire Air National Guard at, eventually. You know, when I knew him, he wasn't. But, wow. Right. Yeah. Wow. So he was sitting next to me at uh, Trooper Basic in, in Shelton, Washington. And uh, when the balloon went up, uh, you know, when they when when 9-11 happened. Uh, I mean, he was gone. He was gone that day. And I saw the, the video of the plane hitting the, uh, the second tower. Uh, I'd been working all night. I went to sleep and my, my wife woke me up. I mean, you know, 30 minutes after I fell asleep, but if it's one of those where you don't know what time it is, uh, but it was about six 45 here. So about nine 45. So one tower is already smoking. Second one hits it. And, and I don't, don't quote me on the times. I don't remember the times, but I watched sure. the second plane or, you know, fly into the, the second tower or the first plane flying to the second part, right? But you know what I'm saying? 
Uh, and when I saw that, I, I, I just looked at her. I said, well, I'm, I'm going to war. And uh, not even six months later, uh, I, I went, right? So, you know, the guys that went September 11th, September 12th, in February of '02, they, you know, they're, they're coming out, right? You know, rip them out. And so guys, Rob right. Kerr, Sandy Lopez, uh, Pav, Mike Brogan, those guys were all coming out. And I was one of the ones to come in and, and, and rip them out. And, and I'm, I, you know, I look at it as uh, I, I went and did that. You know, she, she screwed me out of being a Green Beret. And I, you know, I gave it up thinking I was saving my family. It was, didn't happen. Uh, but I for sure wasn't going to miss this trip, right? So you know, I get there and, and I, I share this with you. Um, I'm landing on, on the, we land on the airstrip. And uh, in, in those days, right, you did not step off anything that was paved or had the metal sheeting because it was all mine, right? right. So, so Hal Sullivan's there and uh, he's, you know, he's like, anybody got any dip? And so I reach in and I don't dip, right? But I, you know, mama raised ugly kids, not dumb ones. So I had plenty of trading stock. So I pull out this fresh can of Copenhagen and I hand it to him. And this guy, I mean, he got the pinky involved, right? He's in that thing. Like he's a proctologist and he's digging around in there and he, you know, and his lips out to here and he hands me his can. There's just dust in it. Right. And I'm like, no, you, you can, you can have that. Hal. Yeah, it's on to and uh, he says, he says, Oh, you know, now uh, I thought, Oh, I'll give you some money. We go back. And I said, oh, I don't, I don't want any money. And he looks at me and he says, what do you want? Right. Like, I'm, you know, like I was going to ask him to take me in the tent. And I said, Al, easy. Okay. I just got here. I just want to go someplace where I'm going to get some work. And he uh, looks me up and down. And he says, all right, we'll do that. Sent me to JBAD, which is, you know, at that time was out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I was the only JTAC for Nangahar, Logman, and Konar province. And uh, you know, Konar was, I mean, Shit, the corn gall. You, you had to go through Konar, the, the, the what what is now you know easy easy Konar to get to the corn gall. In those days, I mean, it was all Indian country, right? So, yeah. uh, so that one can of Copenhagen was, was worth it, right? I got to you, you, here's another JTAC, right? They did have a, a, a dude from the two four was there, um, a couple guys from Dev Group, and they were basically the PSD for the uh, for the OGA guys that were at the at the house. But then they get pulled off for other things. We had uh, so then I became the JTAC for the for the OGA. Uh, the precursor to the Afghan commandos was a, a unit called the Counterterrorism Pursuit Team. It was about a thirty man element that the Aussie SAS trained specifically to go grab dudes, right? Yeah. And the uh, the SF team that I, I was there with, uh, we were charged with training a hundred man mobile reaction force. And they basically the blocking the CTP team would go in with the Aussies and and uh, and grab the dudes. Right. Uh, I wouldn't say the problem. I would say the issue is the Aussies didn't want to go in without a JTAC. Smart. <laughs> oh, that's me. Okay, great. So I'm with the Aussies, and the SF guys are out with the blocking force. You know, completely not happy about that. Yeah. Uh, but you know that's the way it was, and then. That video that you mentioned at the beginning, uh, the, the the Brits had a had an SAS team there in in JBAD, and uh, we got some intel that uh, some you know some bad actors had infiltrated our guard force, our house guard force. Right, we had we had a compound um, that we knocked a wall a hole in the wall to the next one, and knocked a hole in that far wall to the next one. Okay, so we're in this one. The Aussies are in this one. This one was where the OGA uh, asked people questions. Let's just leave it at that. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, I know. (laughs) Uh, So now right here was a mosque. So that's why we never really got shelled at this place. They didn't attack us because they didn't want to hit the mosque. Okay. Um, Yeah. So, So, you know, we get this intel that somebody in our guard force is is a bad actor there's two of them that we're looking for but then we start thinking you know we're, we're, we're getting details of their plan and it, it, it's it's not lining up right like it doesn't 
the, the, the floor plan and all that's not the same. Well, we figure it out. It's the Brits. It's the SAS team. So we tell them and half of their team wants to just kill these guys right now. I right? just, just, just kill them, stick them on a stick outside. So people understand. Uh, and the, you know, the other half is obviously like, we can't do that. Sure. <laughs> let's, uh, let's let them go. And the Americans can go grab. Them. And of course we're like, tell us to stop. <laughs> right. You're not, we're not hunting them down. If you've got them, let's get them. Yeah. So we created this ruse where uh, the Brits would come out to uh, the range that we, that we built out at the JBAT airport. Uh, we had a couple flat ranges there and uh, they would do basic marksmanship training uh, where, you know, all right, we're going to, first we're going to, we're going to disassemble the weapons, do a safety check down the barrel. Cause I mean, you, you know, the Afghans weren't necessarily great on, on the MCS. Yeah, yeah. So, or, you know, even cleaning the weapon or whatever. So it's plausible. So day one, they bring four guys, not including the two chowder heads. And, uh, and they, you know, look down the barrel. Okay. It's clear. It's free of obstruction. Reassemble. Let's begin. And they run through a series of, of, of basically zeroing and, and basic qualification. Okay. So those guys go home. Hey, what'd you do today? They tell the story. Here we are the next day. The Brits show up. Oh, but the Americans are here. Geez, we didn't know you guys were here. We're like, yeah, well, you know what? We're about to take a break anyway. You guys help yourself. And so the cue was when when Simon, the the, the Brit team leader, when he looked down the barrel, right, we were supposed to take these guys down. Now, unfortunately for two other dudes, right, just to make it unobvious, they, there were two guys that just happened to be regular dudes, yeah. right? Well, they still got dumped. Uh yeah, so one, two, three, done, right? My guy is is doing the kimchi squat. So I have to like pick him up to slam him to the ground. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, I kind of come around him and grab him by the scruff of his beard like this. And, you know, the head does normally follow that, sure, sure. right? <laughs> so I'm whipsawing him, trying to get him on the ground. Finally, just reach out and kick his feet out from under him and down he goes. And uh, I'm trying to control him, right? You know, here's the old cop brain. I'm, you know, I've got a least amount of, of uh, force necessary to neutralize the threat. Yeah. Well, then he picks up a rock. So I start kneeing him in the face. And I'm telling you, bro, and you've seen the video. Yeah. Like, I'm coming from yesterday, and I'm hitting his kids in the face. So, uh, and, you know, his teeth are falling out like chiclets. Oh but I did put him in his pocket. I did, I did do that. Uh, you know, I think that's, I think that's the right thing to do. Yeah. It's so courteous of you. Yeah. So, so, so we, we, we get him we get him uh, you know, hooded and, and, and zip tied and, you know, we're going to, I mean, this dude's tough, right? Yeah. I, give, I, I give him that. This, this guy, he didn't say a thing. Once he was zip tied, he was unflappable yeah. uh, until he heard the rotors. And when he heard the rotors, he started kind of shaking a little bit yeah. right and you can smell it right you know chinook coming in you can smell it yeah. you just mm. well even with the the sandbag over his head i mean he now he's he's like quivering yeah and when the rotor wash hit him he shit his pants because oh, he knows where he's going yeah. right? and he's not like we're not taking him to the ritz right uh and uh so that was one of the pictures i sent you of me at the uh at the airport with a dude with a hood on his head okay so these guys were in the Hezbi Islami Golbadin, uh, which was, you know, just a, another jihad group, yeah. uh, party of party of Islam under Golbadin Hekmatyar, who was their, you know, their leader. Right, right. And they were there to kill kill Whitey, and uh, and it didn't work out that well. Yeah, that was that was on that first trip. You know, there was there was one where we were going down to grab Nor Muhammad down in in southern Nangar, and I was with the Aussies and. Uh, Again, you know, we're pushing down the OGA and the Aussies and, and the, the, the SF team is split. They're running split team ops, half with this MRF, half with that MRF. And they're supposed to cordon off the area. We're going to go in and grab this dude. And, you know, that's a great plan. Uh, that's not how it happened. <laughs> so, you know, I and, and so I still remember, right? So I'm calling up uh, because, you know, we're taking fire. And yes, they, 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 uh, you know, the, the army is supposed to, the ground force is supposed to call the tick, right? But I'm not waiting, right? Like you, I got, I'm getting, I'm calling air, right? So I called boss man and I said, Hey, 
need some air, man. We're, uh, we're troops in contact down here. And you can almost hear this little bastard set his pepper down on his plane. He's like, what kind of fire? I key the mic and, uh, you know, uh, small arms, goom, 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 heavy weapons, boom, mortars, and unclick the mic. And, he, you know, there's a change in his tone when he got back on the radio. Yeah. So we're, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going through this, this little town and the, uh, I mean, the Afghans were like locusts. <laughs> they were just pillaging this place, right? I mean, just stealing everything they could and throwing it in the truck. You know, the truck was kind of moving along and they were just like looting this place. And, uh, and Russ Sullivan was the team leader for the Aussies. He eventually retired as the regimental sergeant major of the entire Aussie SAS, but he was standing right behind me and we're coming around. We can hear this, this heavy weapon down the road and, you know, pieing around the corner, we can see it's a dish cut and they've just lowered it and they're just using it shooting down the road anything coming down that road is getting mauled mm. and uh the the team that i was with we didn't have heavy weapons we had a saw and we had a 240. Okay. and this kid crash who was an 18 x-ray right kid was kid turned 21 over there in in, in country he was using the the, the 240 he was imt with the 240 right so you know i'm up to see me i'm down and with the that thing is heavy as hell right you yeah just, uh, but i had the uh i had the i had the saw and uh, I had my M4 on my back with the 203, and that you, really I use the 203 as a marking round sure. more than anything. Um, but Russ says to me, uh, you know, he says, "Ox, you think you can think you can get that guy?" And I, you know, I had the little hundred round nut sack on it, right? When that was out, if I couldn't switch out to to the 200 round box, I would just put mags in. I had tons of mags in me on the back of the truck. We were driving Toyota Tacomas back then, mm -hmm. so. I said, sure, I'll try, right? You know, because it's, it's, I mean, it's, people are shooting at us, right? right. So, you know, I'm quietly <laughs> around and I start, you know, giving it to them and I'm seeing all these flashes, right? And uh, so I'm like, holy fuck, he's shooting at me. So I'm leaning into it and just giving it to him until I, you know, Russ is tapping me on the head. He's like, I think you got him, lad. I think you got him. And that's like a hundred rounds. This dude. Those flashes were me hitting. It was they were you know ricochets. So okay. <laughs> yeah, listen, the good stories are not the ones where you you are a total hero, right? Yeah. They're the ones with that's a great a story. I love that story. Uh, that's awesome. Well, wait for it. Then. Wait for it. <laughs> okay. We're not done. All right. Same trip now. So we got these uh, we got these dudes holed up in a compound, and you know they're listening to our icoms. I mean, you know, we know where they're going. They know what we're doing. Yeah. So you know our terp uh, Golbahar. Is, is talking to him saying, you know, you, you need to, you need to give up. We're going to, we're going to come in and we're going to, we're going to get you. And they're like, you know, piss on that. Try it. So the OGA guy says to me, he says, uh, Hey Ox, you think you can, uh, you think you can do a show of force? I said, listen, if they're in a, if they're in a compound, hold up, you know, a 10s flying overhead is not going to, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to scare them. Right. He's like, Hmm. What about that? Uh, what about that hill over there? Can you, put a bomb on that and you know do that as a show of force. And so I'm looking at it. It's this bald hills, no trees on it. It's nothing on it. I'm like, sure. Yeah, I can do that. Talk the aircraft on and, uh, you know, one doesn't see it. So he's around two thinks he sees it comes in two two uh, rockets to Mark. One says, yep, got it. Comes around right on top of the hill, 500 pounder instantly, instantly. Icon chatter stops shooting stops. There's a lull for about 30 seconds. And then they come back and say, okay, we'd like to talk. <laughs> so I'm very pleased with myself. I'm like, wow. Right. Yeah, there we go. Right. Okay. The Aussies, because they're jokers, are filming this whole thing. Right? Yeah. I mean, just, it's it, just like, you know, when we took the dudes down, sure, right. somebody's filming it. Right? right. But they're zoomed in on the hill because they want to see this bomb hit. And what you can't see from where we are with the Mark one eyeball is that it was a cemetery. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, man. Uh, yeah. So the reason they stopped fighting is, if you know anything about a Muslim cemetery, their graves aren't marked. You you stop mattering when people stop remembering where you're buried. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, tough to remember where tough to remember where Grandpa was buried when there's nothing left. So yeah. So that's why they they we want to talk is because they we're I'm, we're erasing their history. Sure. In, in oh the, man. But, so this is O2, and I got all these clowns whispering, I bombed dead people. 
Did you hear that? Yeah. yeah thanks, guys. That's hilarious. Awesome. It was poops uh, dug in overhead cover. I think that's so. Lesson yeah. learned. If you anyway. want to, if you want to. Really you have to you, yeah, uh, go ahead, go ahead and you know <laughs> confirm your your target. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So, That's awesome. But uh, that trip, that was one uh, where um, you know we, it was open ended. You, you I, I went. And there was no return date. Right. And so I asked. Well, it was probably end of August, uh, and I'd had it. We 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 had it rough for whatever reason. Nineteenth group was resupplied out of K two, uh, but the mail came from. Uh, so we could get mail, but we couldn't get food. So I, I lost 55 pounds. I mean, it was, it was, I, well, I got dysentery too. That, that kind of helped. Helps, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, but we were down to uh, rationing. We had that shelf stable milk and we had juicy juice. We had like a pallet of juicy juice and a pallet of this, you know, that UHT milk. And so the team sergeant was telling everybody, boys, you know, you got to have, got to have two milks and a juice at every meal. It's like, well, it's not a meal because there's nothing to eat, boss. Yeah. And he says, all right, well, you're having two milks three times a day. How about that? Sir. Uh, so then this guy that was with us, Joey Wells, his cousin was the head of the Texas Cattlemen's Association, right? So, you know, big dick energy there. Sure. He sends us, I'm telling you, like refrigerator box size packages filled with squeezable butter, hot dog buns, this gnarly it wasn't meat, but it was taco meat, okay. right? Like, you know, well, we ate it. We ate, we ate the crap out of that. I mean, corn chips that were just dust because they've been smashed and you know, just taking the bag and you know, trying to lick it and clean it. Sure. Uh, I mean, it was so all that to say, I'm having a great time, mom. When can I come home? Oh, yeah. uh, and and CJ Soto says, we don't, we don't have any replacements for you. I said, okay, well, you know, whatever. About a week later, I get called down to the radio room and uh, they're like, Hey, it's for you. So I get on there. I'm like, yeah, what's up? They said, Hey, your replacements on the uh, flight. I said, great. Cool. Um, how long is the handoff? And they said, well, they're going to drop you off or drop him off. And then they, you know, they're going to a couple other uh, fobs and then, you know, they can come back. And I said, today. He said, yeah. I said, I, I got to do a handoff, right? I mean, we're, this is, we're, we're jobbing like almost every day here. Yeah. He said, well, you can take as long as you want for the handoff. Just don't know when we're going to get anyone back up to you. Awesome. It was like so I have two so hours. So it right? Time. Right? Like, like you didn't yes. Have to that way. Yeah. I, no. And, and you know, so, you know, I, I meet the guy at the airfield, come all the way back, um, you know, take him up to the roof, show him where stuff is, give him my book that, I, you know, we you keep the books with all the shit you're doing. Yeah. I uh, said, you know, you got half an hour to copy whatever you want out of that, but you know, I got to take it with me. Yeah. And, uh, and that was it. Hey, good luck. And off I go. Yeah. Right. So, uh, the, the Aussie gods were smiling because it was, I think September 3rd is the birthday of the, uh, of the SAS, whatever day it was, whatever date it is, that's the day that I flew back to poverty. So, uh, as I'm getting on the, the helicopter, Russ and Howie and some of the other uh, Aussies said, "Hey, bud, you got to go to our to our camp on Bagram for dinner tonight because it's it's the birthday." I said, "Absolutely." So you know, I go and you, they knew me, and you know, of course, I go in, and so I've gone from no food, right, or milk and juicy juice and you know whatever foot bread that you know, like you know how it goes, right? If the guy's carrying oh, it like yeah. this, you don't eat the top oh, or yeah. the bottom. If he's carrying it under his arm, you don't eat any of it. Right. So, yeah. Uh, so I, I go from I go from that to uh, I walk into the Aussie camp and they're frying up sausages. They got steaks. There's salad that looks like these vegetables might be fresh. Oh, it was it, I mean, and, and beer and cold beer. Yeah. And uh, yeah, now the Aussies and the OGA could get resupped on on booze. But uh, you know, we we gringos could not. Yeah. So the Aussies sensing that, you know, perhaps it was unfair for them to drink beer um we brewed our own and we called it uh, we got we got the cranberry juice cocktail uh concentrate from uh from bagram we sent some guys down to reset the op fund they came back with a case of orange juice concentrate and cranberry juice concentrate and we sent our turp in town to get regular yeast we took five gallon jerry cans 
took the IV giving sets, punched a hole in it, punched the other into a water bottle, taped it on there so you could watch the off gas. We called it the Coalition Cabernet and the Coalition Crush. And I'm telling you, it was probably awesome. about like drinking a wine cooler, only not as tasty, but, you know, war as hell. Yeah, uh, right. And so we had, 10, we, we had 10 gallons ready to go, 10 gallons in the middle, and 10 gallons just started. And, you know, after about a week of this, we, we said, well, let's do a secondary fermentation and we'll get some bubbles in it. It'll be great. And that lasted for three hours. And we're like, screw it. We're drinking it. Yeah. So... <laughs> Yeah. That's so awesome. then now I'm now I'm in Bagram. I'm at this thing. We're we're having dinner and and, and beers. And then Travis Weitzel, if you ever knew that guy, he's with me because we were there. We both came came uh, back to Bagram the same day. So I dragged him along with me. Well, while we're eating dinner, uh, you know, somebody comes in and says, "If you guys are leaving, your plane is is boarding in an hour." So we you know finish up take off out of there and uh, fly to Rhine mine. And we landed, I don't know, 1130 or something at, at, at night, Rhine mine time. Had enough time to turn in weapons, drop our stuff and make it over to the Johnny Rockets or whatever the bar was called there on base. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're all bearded and dirty in your clothes. Even if you try to wash them, they just, they just look dirty right, right. and your boots are all torn to, to shit. Right. Yeah. And uh, there's a bunch of new guys coming in that are having a, like, their last beer before they go. And you can just hear them. They're like, man, those guys, they've been there. They've been there. Look at them. Look at their boots. And you can hear them, right? It's not like they're being quiet. Sure. But we didn't We didn't buy a beer that whole night. And that was kind of cool. Nice. So the next day, we're sitting out there with, with this, uh, this 20th group team that was heading in. And we're on the parade field just nursing this hangover. <laughs> wondering what we're going to do for the day because they don't leave until the next day so we're sitting there and we see this guy coming across the parade field he gets a little closer we can tell he's an officer he gets a little closer we can tell he's the chaplain and we're drinking beers out on the parade field right probably not supposed to be doing that uh and he comes up and he says uh, you know he's looking at us he's like uh, you boys just get back yes sir he says having some beers yes sir we're about to finish and throw them away he says no i don't not on my account and this is back, you know, in Germany, they had the ration cards, right? So he oh, says, yeah. well, you know, I can't get you a lot, but can I get you a bottle? It'd be, be very nice of you, Chaplain. <laughs> Thank you. So Chaplain went and got us a bottle and brought it back. And that's when we made the command decision to go to Sachsenhausen. And I won't tell that story on this <laughs> podcast. But, yeah, right. Yeah. So, Are you a little sporty over there? Anyway. Yeah. It, it, yes. Yeah, I, I had a fight with a cigarette machine. That, <laughs> oh, that's the only tidbit I'll give you. Okay. I won. Oh, right on. Good job. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that was that trip. So I got my, you know, that was uh, that was the first trip in 02. Uh, and then six months later, I was parachuting into uh, Iraq with 173rd. And, and I was the only guard guy that, that went on, that actually jumped. That's kind of messed up because a lot of, a lot of guard guys, you know, took this deployment thinking that, you know, that's the job they're going to do. And uh, we, we were at Aviano. Well, let me back up. So there were two guys that were actually picked to go from the unit. Uh, and one of them, yeah, he, he's out rucking, doing some PT. And he uh, kind of rolls his ankle, you know, steps off the road, rolls his ankle a little bit. We would have all just taped it up and gone on and, you know, whatever, right? But I sensed a little opportunity. I said, oh, man. You, you, you okay? Because like that, you know, those can creep up on you. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, I mean, it's injured now. You're going to jump in. What if you hurt it more? Then you're going to be on the DZ and people are going to be shooting at you and you can't move. But well, good luck. And I, <laughs> you know, off I go, right? So, so I'm in this guy's head. And by the end of the day, he's, you know, could barely, he's limping. He's, oh, God, oh, God. So... You know, I get called into the commander's office and he's like, hey, um, I know you just got back, but we need somebody to go. And, you know, you're the I'm like, oh, yeah, for my country, I, well, I would, sure. I'll do that. Right. right, right. Yeah. I took the oath. I, I raised my hand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going. Right. I mean, that that first trip I, I told you, you know, on the thing. I mean, so they had this little train up before that that trip in no two. you know, because it's the guard. Right? You're going to make sure these guys are fit and can do right. the job. And so, you know, I'm looking around and. Like the list has already been made before we even got there. Who's going? And they're all from the Illinois Guard. Yeah, yeah. So I told that guy six pack. I said, I don't know whose legs I need to break, but I'm going. So <laughs> pick them out, right? Because someone's not going, and I am. And so you know, here I am. Now I'm going to jump in. 
And uh, yeah. we get to Vicenza to Camp Ederly and they're doing the final rehearsals on the parade field. And then, you know, everybody comes in and Sergeant Major's up on the, up on the little stand and giving his hoo speech. And he says, all right, any questions? And I raise my hand. And so <laughs> this is in March of 03. Right. We're in DCUs, but, you know, I've modified DCUs. So I got pockets on the sleeves and stuff that's taken for granted now with, with the modern uniform. Right? But we had sure. modified our uniforms. Right? So I had pockets on the sleeve, no names, no rank, Fu Manchu mustache. And just because I'm, you know, like life is too short to be boring. My, I, I took my hair and just stood it up. Right. So it's just it's 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 just it's all greasy and dirty and whatever. And, uh, <laughs> right. you know, so obviously like hmm, that guy's not in the army. And uh, he looks at me, he says, Air Force? And I said, Roger that, Sergeant Major. He says, all right, what do you got, Air Force? I said, well, since 10th Group is on the ground uh, and have already secured the airfield, why don't we just land and we could have everybody on the ground, four to five positions in about half an hour. And you'd have thought I asked to have sex with his mom in church yeah. while pouring sugar in his gas tank, right? This guy, the veins are coming out on yeah. his head and his neck, and he's, we're jumping. Like, Roger that, Sergeant Major. And, you know, everybody's looking at me like, what an asshole. I'm like, oh, no, I mean, voice of reason. It makes sense, though. Like, it's already I just, you know, come it? on, guys, yeah. right? It's a risk, you know. No, no. We, we jumped. And uh, it snowed an hour before we went in. They told us we were going to jump at 12, 1,200 feet, which is a pay jump. But they And they issued us reserves, right? Okay. All right. So we're jumping at 1,200. Yes. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, where do I draw my ammo? They're like, oh, right over there. So I go over, and uh, the guy gives me, like, three magazines and, you know, one one mag for, for the pistol. I said, bro, where, where's, where's my ammo? He's like, well, you're you're uh, you're in the talk. You're on the executive staff because I was the bailo, right? Which that that whole project, what a joke that was, right? Um, he says, well, you're 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 in the talk, so you don't get a full combat load. I said, well, the talk is jumping. What do you think's happening when we get on the ground? Like, there's no t- that's not safe. Right. He's like, well, I said, well, all right, all right. I said, fine. Give me give me the, give me the grenades for my uh, from two hundred three. He's like, oh, can't 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 do that, Sergeant. I'm like, why not? As well, because you're, you know, you're, you're on the executive side. I'm like, yeah, geez, like, come on. So we're out there. We're at Aviano, and everybody's shooting up. Well, no, let me back up. The night before we're going to jump, they do this big hoo speech. We're going to war, man. This is D-Day. This is our moment to shine. Except it wasn't that that good. Right? Mm-hmm. Like I just delivered a better speech in three seconds. <laughs> and then they said, but we're going to have steak and lobster. So appoint someone to watch your gear. And rotate and just get in there and get you some steak and lobster. So I said, great. So, like, I'm the ranking enlisted dude for, you know, all the guys uh, in the guard. So, come on, let's go eat. We get there. And they're like, uh, what's your, you know, they got the, the manifest. And they're like, what's your name? I said, uh, you know, Sergeant Higgins. Uh, okay, Sergeant, yeah, head on in. And so I just stepped to the side. Next guy comes up and his name's not on the manifest because he's not jumping. So he can't eat. I said, right. guys. He's going, he's going to get there tomorrow, right? Like a day after us. And he can't come and have a steak and lobster. He's like, I'm sorry, Sergeant. You know, this, is, this is Sergeant Major's orders. I said, well, that's stupid. And he's stupid. And we're not going to eat your fucking steak and lobster. I said, boys, let's go. And we went to, uh, went to the Burger King and we had a double Whopper eating contest who could eat it in the fewest bites. And I won with three, but th- <laughs> that's not something you want to see or try to attempt again. Right. Anyway. That's the kind of nonsense that we're talking about, right? Yeah, that's stupid. So now it's the next yeah. day, right? We're, we're on the flight line. They're getting everybody to shoot up. And I'm not putting that shoot on any sooner than I need to, right? So this little private comes up and he's like, what size shoot do you need? I said, I need a, I need a six. And he's like, oh, okay. And off he goes. You know, they only go up to five, right? So he, I mean, he's, he's gone a good 20, 25 minutes looking for a six. So I'm, you know, I'm loving it. And uh, I, I see this, this, Loadmaster, you know, and I said, Hey, um, did they talk to you about the heavies? And he's like, Oh yeah, yeah. You, you want to talk to that guy? So I go over to, uh, to the, to the army dude who's, you know, the liaison. And I said, Hey, but the heavies are going in first, right? He's like, yeah. I said, right. And, um, and they're, they're, they're marked and it, you know, the, the, the stuff he says, yes. I said, with what? He's like, oh, God. it's chem lights. I'm like, great. What color? He's like, you know, he's looking at me like, what are you stupid? 
uh, they're IR chem lights. It's war. I said, yeah, we're jumping static line, dickhead. So we don't have nods on. How the f*** do we see these things? And you can tell he never thought of that. He's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, so dude smoked into ISU 90s. You know, they hit the, the Humvees that were buried up to their door handles in the mud that was up there. Yeah, good job, guys. So it snows an hour before we fly in, right? And we had to cross Turkey at 35,000 feet and then get down to jump altitude. So we're already hooked up, facing the back of the plane, up, you know, well, you know, it's a, it was a real treat. Yeah. Then they put us out. Now, they had cut power to the nearby town, so there's no light. There's just kind of that hazy glow. But, this, mm-hmm. but with clouds, I mean, you could, there was really no discernible horizon. Um, but, you know, I come out of the plane like a homesick refrigerator. I know how fast I fall. Right. And they put us out at 1,200, right? So I need to be lowering my ruck. So I'm leaning over to lower it when my left foot and then my face makes contact with my wrap oh, and knocks geez. me the Yeah. Busted my helmet, knocked me out. Uh, there were five minutes between chalks, and I woke up to planes overhead. So it was at least five minutes later. Oh. Man. Yeah, I did report to hire three times that I had been injured and that, you know, my helmet was broken. I need a replacement. Um, I was reminded of that the next day. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, Higgins, we got it. Your helmet's busted. All right, shut up. <laughs> so uh, the the, uh, the the Green Beret that was uh, checking me for, for, you know, doing concussion protocol on me, his foot, I forget which one it was, but one of them was not. Right. So oh. they're both supposed to be this way. Sure. Yeah. And one of them wasn't. <laughs> oh. And he's leaning on his rifle as a crutch and he's doing the gaze and the stagnus to me. And he's like, yep, you got a concussion. I'm like, okay, so uh, what can you give me for it? He says, nothing. So why not? He says, well, dude, you have a head injury. I said, oh, okay. Well, my hip's really hurting. Can I get something for that? He says, no. I'm like, why not? He's like, you have a head injury. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just going to go to bed. No, you can't. I'm like, excuse me. He says, dude, you have a, you, you you have a head injury. We can't give you medicine. We can't let you sleep. We got to observe you. I said, well, this is bullshit. Yeah. So Matt Foote and I sat on the ground like Forrest and Bubba Gump back to back. It's freezing cold, right? We're in the mud, the, just the shit sandwich buffet. And he, every probably 45 seconds, he's elbowing me to keep me awake, right? And he's like, wake up Higgins. So next morning, you know, I didn't pay their light bill. So this very, very faint, hazy sun comes up, right? But it's light enough you can look around. And people have been showing up at rally points, you know, like barehanded. They're like, what happened? Like, oh, man, sorry. My, my gear burned in, man. Sorry. And, and you know, the jump was so screwed up yeah. that they were putting people out left, right, short. Juan Valentin, <laughs> he came down in the town. He had to eat any out of the town, right? Oh, my God. So, yeah, I mean, it was the, the, this jump. Like, there's nothing majestic about this jump. Right? It was the mating of the whales. And it went so, anyway, now the sun's up, and you're looking around the countryside, and you see all this gear, right? People had landed, probably hard, got in the mud, and just said, Fuck this, pop their ruck, and off they go, right? They're just, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. So, there's all this stuff littering the countryside. So, I went out. And I grabbed one of the chutes that was laying out on the countryside and I made myself a little hooch. And uh, they said, all right, Higgins, you can go to sleep. And dude, I slept in that, in that parachute hooch that was, you know, it's like just barely off the ground, right? Because we didn't have any sticks to, to stake it. But I was in there for 18 hours out cold. What? Just my brain was, oh yeah, it was bad. Oh, it was, they, 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 Matt, Matt Foote was checking on me to make sure I was still breathing. They're like, let him sleep, you know, let him, let him sleep. Jeez. But when I woke up, obviously, you know, like I'm not, I mean, you know, I was, I was alive, sure, sure. but uh, yeah, but that noodle, it, it, there are times now, I mean, you know, that I don't think of it this way. You go to the library and you're looking for a book, right? We used to have this thing called the Dewey Decimal System. I don't know how old you are. Yeah. You go to a little card catalog and you look it up. You'd be like, oh, it's in aisle five, shelf 12. Got it. You go there and the book's not there. Where the hell's the book, right? Somebody put the book on the wrong shelf. Mm. Okay, that's how my memory is a lot now. Oh, okay. Books are in there. They're in there. They're just, they're not on the right shelf. So. Do you, um, do you do anything? Uh, do you, are you, t- are you in any treatment for the, the TBI or anything like that? Or what, what do you, what do you do for it? Or. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, basic self-care, right? Yeah. Uh, so 
my my hands shake because uh, that was one of I've, I've got two TBIs, um, and so if I'm tired, what do, what do we do? We drink more coffee, so, which makes it worse, right? I'm tired. I'm over caffeinated, you know. So I just have to. I got my I got my water, in my copper bottle because it's antimicrobial, right? right? Can't be drinking that plastic nonsense. Right. Uh, but then CBD. I take CBD. CBD is a great anti-inflammatory. There's no psychoactive properties. It's not like you can get stoned. Sure. But I don't take opioids. I don't take any pharmaceuticals because you know all that stuff's garbage. Good. Bad for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I, I talk to a therapist every time something you know you. Your foot hurts. What do you do? You take care of it. Your arm's broken. You definitely get that taken care of. What if your head's broken? Why aren't we taking care of that? Right. So, you know, and uh, I was talking to, to Ed Wombolt, uh, if you know him. At, I, I saw him at Soft Week, and he's big into helping vets get alternative treatment. So, you know, there are some psychoactives uh, that, that are being tested to help with PTS and uh, with TBI. And he said, he's, I mean, swears by it. And I'm, I'm interested in, in, in looking into that because, uh, in fairness, I probably had PTS before I ever went to combat just from being a trooper and scraping people's kids off the highways and horrific crashes and, you know, burned up people and whatever, oh, but sure. it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you don't, it doesn't have to be horrific to be traumatic. We had right. a guy that he just, he, he left when his, his new baby was like three days old and it just kind of fucked him up, right? Because he right, couldn't, right. you know, back in those days, you, you weren't talking. You, you didn't have a phone. You didn't, there was no Skype. There was none of that stuff. So right. for six months, he he just anguished over his kid and it just kind of messed him up, right? Yeah. So he should be talking to somebody. And uh, that's something we don't do. You know, we were supposed to be supermen. We're supposed to be great. We're supposed to be amazing. And, and, and then when we're not, you know, okay, next man to the front, right? right. Thanks, Higgins. Go have a seat, you know, sit this one out. Well, that's not, that's not cool. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of, of alternative uh, medicine, not because I'm a hippie, but because, you know, before we had Prozac and all this other stuff, what, what did we do? Well, how do we take care of ourselves? Let's get back to that, right? Eating better food, sleeping, talking about problems. So, yeah, I know that's yeah. a, just went down a, a rabbit hole there, but. I no, no. Uh, we talk about a lot on this podcast about uh, uh, alternative solutions. I mean, there, you know, there's a lot of guys in Congress now that are advocating for it. I mean, uh, they're, they're, they're the vets, um, veterans exploring treatment solutions. But it's that uh, it's the psychedelic um, treatment that you. Guys there's are- vets in pain. Um, that that uh, uh, Kenny Walker was in my unit. He got pretty messed up, and he turned me on to it. And it was supposed to be, you know, alternatives to pain management. Mm-hmm. Just getting opioids and whatever, right? Like, let's let's fix the problem. Let's not let's don't mask the sure. symptoms. Um, but they've and and I get these emails, you know, and, and and they do treatments in Peru or you know down in Mexico or wherever yeah, ayahuasca same. is you know legal. The problem is those things are like you know like two weeks long sometimes. I mean, I can't take off two <laughs> right. weeks to go do that, right. you know. So it's not it's it it. That, that, uh, that, that there's that option but you know that that's not that that's not tenable right that's not available to everybody sure so we I gotta think, get better about that yeah i think the answer i think what they're trying to do is bring it here you know have it more accessible yes. because that's true that let not it's great and, and people swear by it you know i've had a bunch of guys on have here you have you gone it. i have not i haven't yet uh but i've talked to a bunch of guys and but it but like you said you know, I can't, can I can't just take off and go down there and, and do that kind of thing. So yeah, having it here, having it accessible to guys or heck, VA, VA backed, you know, that'd be even better. You go down to the clinic and they hook you up and then you're good to go. And because, if, because those, those things, you know, at least that, that we're talking about that are, you know, in some other country, they, there, there are, you know, there are, uh, you know, scholarships or whatever you want to call them where they'll pay, they'll pick up your flight and they'll, you know, they'll pay for you to get to it but there's only so many dollars to go around. Sure. Right. And, and I can't in good conscience say, yeah, pay for me because, you know, I'm, I have a good job, right. I make right. money yeah. and uh, okay. But if I'm going to spend three, $4,000 to go to Peru, you don't have my wife with me and sure. we're going to be eating dinner. We're going to have, you know, like that, that's, yeah, yeah. that's, it's, it's, it's expensive. Right. Um, 
And oh, by the way, no, you're not. You're going to be in this uh, little facility, and we're going to be running this, you know, these tests. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, yeah. But I think so, to your point, though, I mean, I, I think just the bare minimum of not bare minimum, but I think as like you were saying, living a healthy lifestyle can help with that stuff too. I mean, you don't have to drown it with beer. Hundred percent, dude. The, the pharmaceutical and like kind of like you alluded to, you know, they just want to throw these medicines at you, and I and I'm kind of a a conspiracy theorist, I guess, in a little bit. I don't, I don't think they're necessarily trying to help you. They just want to keep you medicated. You know, just keep taking this pill. One hundred percent, buddy. One hundred percent. What's what's the symptom? Oh, we got a pill for that. Not what's the cause. Not how do we fix it. You know, hey, this the 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 dam's leaking, and I've got my finger in the hole, but I'm getting tired. Fine, use another finger. Mm. But that's not fixing the hole, right? Like, right. what are you talking about? Exactly. Uh, yeah, and, and it's not a conspiracy theory if it's true. Right. You know, my, my father my father in law is seventy seven years old. He's an old Vietnam vet and he did twenty eight years, retired as a chief master sergeant. I mean he's tougher than beaver dentures. Yeah. But the Air Force back in those days beat him up, right? Sure. He's you know, he busted his arm, his feet, you know, he fell out of a tree doing you know, whatever, right? Yeah. Uh and I have this theory that at, at our age, the fastest way they get us off the rolls is to give us whatever we ask for. Yeah. Whatever pills you want. We'll give you a 90 day supply. Oh, you, you ate it all in 30. No problem. Here you go. Mm. At his age, they get them off the rolls by withholding treatment. Right. So that's going to kill him faster than getting the treatment. Yeah. So he went in, he had just, he had these sharp pains in his head and he just crazy. Right. And we're like, Don, you gotta, you gotta go, go get this looked at. What they determine is, He's got this massive sinus infection that's starting to get into the bone. It's been untreated for so long. And the doc says to him, well, we got to do emergency surgery because if we don't, you could lose your eye. You could lose your right eye. He's like, oh, okay. And they're like, all right, here's your pre-consult. It was six weeks later for the pre-surgery consult. And they didn't give him a script for antibiotics. And he comes home and I'm like, Brian, does that make sense to you? Well, it's so bad you're going to lose your eye, but you, you, what? Yeah. I said, don't go to the VA ever again, Don. Don't ever do that again. And and lo and behold, he goes to his, you know, his civilian doctor and the guy's like, oh my God, you know, hooks him up to IV antibiotics, gets him, you know, like he's in the hospital for a day to like run the, the treatment on that and then gives him, yeah, yeah. It's nonsense. I know. So they got, they got their pound of flesh out of us and they, you know, now it's time to stop talking and go sit in the corner. Right? Right. And I feel that, I, I feel that way. Right. I mean, you know, especially the things that they're doing now for our guys, you know, I don't know if you've been to a, to an ASOS recently. Oh yeah. Right. But these are, these are world-class athlete programs okay. and it's good and they should be doing that. Yeah. That the facilities are better, the food, the nutrition, the knowledge, the education is better. And it's good to see. What else are we doing though? Like it, it ends. Okay. You're done. You're out. See you later. Yeah. There's no transition. Right, right. There's no, hey, this is what you need to be doing on your own, and this is how you can be doing it. Yeah, I think there That's are some. Thought. I think the Tech P Association is kind of working on that kind of stuff right now. Like I know um, the the leadership over there is really involved. They're really interested in doing that very thing. You know, they want to make sure that guys that are in are prepared for when they get out. You know, they have like a plan. Right. And they have knowledge, and you know, so yeah, I think I think they're working on it, which is great. I mean, and like. Like you said, when we first came in, there was none of that. It was like, hey, you put your money right. in a mutual fund. Well, what does what does that mean? Eh, I don't. Worry. You'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, you know. Savings bonds, bro. Savings bonds. <laughs> right. I still yeah. have like a couple double E series savings bonds. Right. right. Like mm, that's a good investment. Yeah, exactly. All um, I was doing with those is just taking beer money out of my pocket and putting it in a lockbox for a right. hundred years or however long it takes for those things to achieve face value. Right. Yeah. 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 When I bought my first motorcycle, I was like, screw it. These aren't, these things are, this is a pile of shit. Oh, yeah. And I just pulled them out of a box and went down to, to, to the bank and cashed them and got a cashier's check and walked in and bought my bike. Like, yeah. And here's your retirement Higgins. Good job. Yeah, I know. That sounds about what I did. Yeah. So wait, so let's back up. Let's go, let's go back to Iraq. So okay. you jumped in, you, you got banged up. Yep. What, uh, yep. yeah. Take me from there. What happened after that? So, um, so Matt Foote and I, so I was the Balo or e Balo, whatever you want to call it, e Balo, sure. and he was my NCOIC, right? And uh, we we pushed forward with uh, 
um, you know, we were, we were all ready to go get in the fight, but, but, uh, the 173rd commander was, uh, reluctant. Let's just say that. I don't want to speak ill of the guy, sure. you know, it doesn't matter what I think of him, but he didn't get in the fight. And, uh, so we were forward doing something it, it just, you know, but not in the fight. I mean, we're just not on, uh, Bashur DZ yeah. and this SF team comes up they were looking for resupply of some bandages and meds or whatever. And, and, uh, and, uh, they saw, they saw us there and they're like, you guys air force. I'm like, yeah. And like, you know, Johnny Knipe. I said, hell yeah, I know Johnny Knipe. How do you know Johnny Knipe? And he turns and he points over the mountains. He's like, well, he's over there and that's where we're going. I said, you mean that's where we're going? <laughs> he's like, jump in. So I go back and the, and, uh, the commander of the, of the, uh, uh, second of the 503rd was, uh, God, I can't remember his name and it doesn't matter, but he'd spent his young lieutenant time and captain time in Ranger Regiment. Okay. So he was all about fighting. Like this guy wanted to go fight, but he wasn't there at the time. He was off at some meeting. Right. And so is, uh, the three who, I mean, again, anytime I took the helmet or hat off, my hair was just, I would, I would make sure it was standing up because <laughs> it pissed people off. Sure. Right. And the, and the mustache, you know, whatever. So, so I walk in there and, uh, I said, uh, Hey, sir, just, uh, just let you know, I'm taking uh, Sergeant foot. We're going to liaise with 10th group just over those, uh, just over that ridge line over there. And he looks at me and he says, now, why would you do that? I said, well, you know, I'm trying to be all serious. I'm like, well, you know, to collect Intel and get the lay of the battlefield and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, mm-hmm. Be careful. Have a good time. So off we go. We link up with Johnny Knight. We get to their house. He takes us up to the roof because he's, you know, again, this is where we're controlling our strikes from. What they had been doing is they, they came in and, you know, they were fighting the, uh, uh, they, with the Ansar al-Islami or whatever they were, the party up there, the shitheads. Yeah. So they're killing them, occupying that battle position to SSE and then just their leapfrogging, right? Okay. So in the little little town of Uzni, which is north of the of the Kani Domlin Ridge, which separates Kurdistan from Iraq, and uh, so we're we, you know we go up to the roof and got the binos and he's talking us on you know terrain analysis and this is that and they had these uh, uh, oil fires that they lit, so you know it's just all smoky. I mean you can't really see anything, and uh, and then we get into it. I mean here they you know they're shelling to Uzni and. Uh, some uh, artillery on the on the ridge was shelling us, mm-hmm. and so this is this is Johnny's AO. So he's actually doing the the cleared hot, but sure. you know, we're we're lazing for him. We're we're you know we're, we're being good romance like you would, right? Like yeah. shit, I want to be part of this, yeah. right? I'm not going to sit around and watch this. Uh, so in an alternate universe, uh, after that, we might have had some FS pills, but of course we weren't doing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but uh, but 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 I did. You know, while the while the, you know all the, the the good stuff's happening, I'm on a sat phone to my to my wife, and and you know she can hear it. She's like, "Oh my God, where are you?" I said, "I can't tell you that, right?" But you know, just watch the news. Yeah. You'll see us. <laughs> and uh, and you know, this is surreal, right? You know, sure. beer in hand. That's happening, right? Talking on the phone. Uh, but the next day we got up. And we moved forward. We went to this, uh, uh, it had been a prison and it was huge, right? Huge. And we drive in to the courtyard and we're going to go up these uh, stairs to the roof that overlooks. I mean, so literally it is when we got to the roof, uh, we're looking down, there's a road and across that is the Connie Domlin Ridge. Okay. And that's where, you know, bad guys are, right? But to get to the roof, we had to walk by this 2,000 pounder that had gutted, that had come through and just gutted right there. Oh. I mean, you, you can touch it. I'm not, I never did because I'm like, mm, let's leave it alone, right? I'm like, oh, <laughs> probably don't even look at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're up there. Um, we had some PSYOP guys that had come with us and they had their speakers and all that. And so uh, once they turn those speakers on, the shooting stops. Because these people want to hear what they're saying, right? Because they're speaking in, in Arabic. And uh, once they realize what they're saying, basically, uh, Baghdad has fallen. 
you know, give up. I mean, they poured it on. Sure, they, sure. They, they went to town. Yeah, because they, they didn't believe us. But but Baghdad had fallen. This was this was April 10th. Baghdad had fallen the day before. So we're up there. We're doing our job. That they were they were using taxis to like basically troop transport. <laughs> and uh, Johnny's team. I mean, they were smoking these guys with javelins. You, you know, the the little opals or whatever those cars are. I mean, they're not built to get hit by anything, no. much less a javelin. Right. Yeah. And yeah, so, uh, and you know, maybe it's perverse, right? But the, those are bringing up fond memories, just watching these things get smacked. Um, but in those days, right, because it's the beginning of the war still, we had planes check on with WIC mids, we're dropping those. Uh, Johnny Johnny was working when the guy checked on, he had a JSAL. And, and yeah, and Johnny looks at us and he's like, holy shit, we, you, you want to? I want to see that. So he's like, yeah, absolutely. That guy. <laughs> I mean, that's like a you know, million dollars per, right? 750 or something per, per, uh, per unit. And I mean, it, it was cool, but it wasn't like, you know, like, okay, yeah, that's yeah. it. All, All right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, they, they started actually getting pretty, pretty accurate on the range and one round hit. I don't know, 25 meters outside the prison and we're on the roof, but you know, the effects are coming. So sure. we got to go. And, uh, you know, everybody's running. And of course you're, you're open, you're, you're in the open, you're exposed to get back to the stairwell and I'm halfway to the stairwell. And one of the guys is like, shit, I forgot my radio. I had a little, um, kind of embitter. Yeah. And I'm like, I got it. And so I turn around and go back to get it, come back. Right. You know, not because I'm a hero, but because shit, I, you know, you, you know, anyway, so yeah. we got to go down past the 2000 pounder that still hasn't blown up, but could at any minute. And then back to the team house and uh, get a little sun bath sitting up there. It's kind of surreal. Like, Hey, that was cool. And all of a sudden see these trucks going by, right? I mean, anything, a pickup truck, a dump truck, a water truck, and it had curds clinging to them like howler monkeys. Mm. I'm like, what the hell's going on? Well, all those dudes that we've been fighting just gave up. They're like, they found out for real Baghdad was, was, was done. And they, and so the, the, the way to Kirkuk is wide open. So we're like, holy shit, let's get going. We, we load up, we grab all, we're not coming back, boys, grab your shit. And, uh, and we, we, we head on and we're, we're just coming through the ridge and, uh, you know, start getting pot shots at us. Right. So we on ass and we're figuring it out. And then, there's a couple of idiots that, you know, they, they got left behind or they, they were supposed to be a delaying action and the Kurds hadn't found them because the Kurds would have smoked them, right? The Kurds are gone. The Kurds are in Kirkuk, right? right. Uh, or on their way. And so we round these guys up and and uh, you'll see him on TV. Jim Shudo, he's on ABC or CNN or something, right? Okay. Some newscaster. Yeah. yeah, he was with us, right? This guy, I, I'm pretty sure he put some Snickers in his panties. When one of the uh, Kurds AD'd right next to him, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. And you're like, easy now. Just, just easy now. Okay, now he's, you know, it, yeah. And, and now he's, you know, I don't know. He's a news anchor on one of those channels. Oh, but okay. yeah, he was, he was, yeah, he was kind of a little pussy. Uh, did I say that out loud? I apologize. <laughs> yeah. um, but, it, you know, anyway, so we get into Kirkuk Air Base and it's, it's a ghost town. I mean, it's gone. It's empty. Yeah. And we're, you know, still clearing buildings and trying to understand, you know, if there is anybody. And uh, man, in the they had the in the chow hall, they were making bread, and one of those big, uh, you know, like looks like a KitchenAid, you know, but yeah. it's industrial size. Right, right. And and the, and the yeast has, or the, the bread has been proofing, and it's just spilling out. Oh, it's like growing. It's but it's it, it, like they left in a hurry. Yeah, yeah. So, oh yeah. So that was. Uh, I mean, that was surreal. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And so my, my, my call sign in Iraq was Red Bull. And so I, I, uh, I got found a piece of cardboard, you know, probably from an MRE box. I don't remember. And we, not me, cause I'm not that artistic, but one of the guys basically cut a stencil, looked like the old bull on Casey's masterpiece barbecue. Okay. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just like a longhorn bull. And we got some red spray paint and we started tagging every building. Red Bull, Red Bull, Red Bull. You know, <laughs> stupid, but it was, okay. it was fun for us. Sure. So there was a vehicle survivability ditch that uh, that 
we would just go to all the buildings and grab furniture and bring it down there and burn it at night. And that was our, that was our TV. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had a, we had a dog that, that we rescued from that, from that, uh, Connie Domlin Ridge. His mom had gotten smoked. And, uh, so we had this little puppy and we called him Rocco because you know, we were with the 503rd, the rock. And so, uh, then somebody fed it antifreeze and killed our dog. So we had a fire. Yeah. Assholes. Yeah. So we had, uh, so we had a, a, a biking funeral for him and it, and the fire was so big that they, like the air force by this point had come, they were, they were there mm. and they had fire trucks to protect the planes. Uh, the C 17s were landing at, at, they cleared the airfield and you know, this is, I mean, this is like a week after we got there. Yeah. But the fire is so, I mean, the flame, they're visible from the airfield, right? So they can't get in because the way the buildings are, you can't get in there. And so they, you know, here, hut, 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 come all these dudes with hoses and like water packs and all this. And we're sitting on the ground by the survivability bench watching Ranger TV, right? right. <laughs> and they're just looking at, what the, what are you, what are you guys doing? Like, they're in our dog. <laughs> I mean, they had not, what, <laughs> they just looked at us, they looked at each other like, are, what? <laughs> Hut, 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 back they go. So that was the last fire we were allowed to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is a cool story. I want to tell this because I will forget. Yeah. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're there at Kirkuk and this farmer comes to the gate and he says, Hey, there's a, there's an American plane that went down. And uh, I just, you know, wanted to tell you about that. You know, everybody's like, there's no plane that went down. What are you talking about? All right. He says, no. And the next day he comes back and he's got a piece of the, of the wreckage. Right. And you look at it and you're like, well, shit, that is from a plane. I mean, you can't, you know, it's a piece of metal. Right. Right. All right. We're going to go. We're, we're, let's, let's find out. And, uh, we, we had corroborated that a strike Eagle had gone down at the beginning of the war somewhere near Kirk Cook. Okay. Maybe this is it. Let's go find out. So, you know, group of us go out there, um, and, uh, sure enough, there's, there's wreckage, but you know, look, dude, it's been like a month, you know, or, you know, it, it's, it's tough because there's sure. parts of plane and, you know, I mean, there's parts of people that the dogs haven't eaten. And, and so it's just nasty. So we, we got, um, we got a box or boxes, sorry. And we tried to collect pieces, right. You know, whatever we found. And there was another team that came out after us and, you know, did a more thorough job. But um, anyway, we, we brought all that stuff in and we didn't know what kind of plane it was, right? We just, you know, we, we heard that it was a strike Eagle, but is it, I mean, you know, what are we really looking at? And so because of that, we, we were expecting to find two people, you know, I don't think we found enough to make one, but it doesn't matter. We got back, we did an impromptu honor guard, put on our berets and we, you know, the SC-17 flew from, I don't, Kuwait somewhere, Ali Asalim or whatever, flew up. We, you know, tried to be, you know, respectful and, and do a, an honor guard to put the remains on the plane. And this lieutenant received them and off he goes. Now, I don't, I don't know how long that flight is, you know, a couple hours, whatever, three hours. So he gets down there. Several hours later, we get called, hey, you got to go down, down to the airfield. So for what? And they're like, well, you know, there's a plane coming in. You guys got to meet it. So this lieutenant got up, was told, go, go collect the remains, flew up, got them, flew them back. And the general said, you need to get something for those boys. And so he had a pallet of Cokes, chewing tobacco, cigarettes, KFC, right? It's all cold and greasy, but shit, we had, we've been eating MREs for, you know, for every day for right. the previous six weeks. And, uh, and that kid had to fly all the way back up there and offload this pallet for us just because we had recovered the remains. And, and, and in fairness, I mean, we, you know, we took this seriously, right? Like, I don't want to, I'm, I'm, it's surreal, but, but you know, look, this is somebody, right? Sure, so for sure. we were, we were, you know, we were, we were reverent about it. Yeah. Well, years later, uh, I was dating my now second ex-wife that, that's telling <laughs> who was, uh, she, she flew the strike Eagle and, uh, she was doing some, uh, uh, currency training or something at Seymour Johnson. I went out to visit her and we're driving around and, you know, I've never been to Seymour Johnson. So I'm, I'm trying to read all the plaques and Hey, what's that building? What, what you know, what, who's that? And 
And uh, she says, uh, oh, that's, um, that's a memorial to, uh, to Salt and Booty. And I said, who's that? She said, oh, those are guys that, that went down in, in Iraq. And I said, uh, or Salt and Boot, Salty and Boot. And I said, uh, I said, oh, okay. Um, so what happened to them? She's like, no, nah, I think they got target fixation and just flew into the target, right? I said, oh, that sucks. I said, uh, I said, you know, as a matter of fact, I, I was part of a, a, a team. We went out and recovered some guys and it was supposed to be a strike. She said, well, where was it? And I said, well, it was in the north. And she says, it's probably them. I said, no kidding. So by now we're walking. Here's the, here's the, no, no. We get up to it. Okay. I don't know who Salty was, but Boot was called Boot because his name was Eric Doss. Doss Boot, right? Mm -hmm. That was his call sign. So Eric Doss was my classmate at the academy. No way. Still, no yeah, way. dude, still gives me, still gives me good. I'm, I, got, I get goosebumps right now. No my way. My hair Yes. Yes. Oh my yes. God. Yes. That's amazing. Yes. That's amazing, man. Yes. Yeah. What are the odds of that? I I don't couldn't calculate them. Oh, that's amazing. What? Oh my god. Right? Right? Let me let me let me tell you this, right? Think about your life. All the twists and turns, all the paths you've taken, all the roads not taken, professionally, personally. They've all led you right here, right now, yeah. right? I mean, on that path, last time I saw Eric was at the zoo, very much alive, very much a handful, and just funny as shit. Had you talked to him you know? since the zoo till at, at, at nope. all? No, just nope. you, you, guys were, nope. you guys saw each other there and nope. then left part of Nine years there. later, I'm picking him up. I'm picking him and his buddy up off the ground. That's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. Right? Yeah, dude. Man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Man. Um, that's a great story. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. So that trip to Iraq was seven seven weeks long. Right after that, I got sent home because I, uh, I was a guard guy. Yeah. And I'd already been to Afghanistan. And they're like, well, shit, you know, there's no fighting going on. Send these guys home. They got, they got day jobs. All right. I'm like, yeah, send us home. You know, this is stupid. And that same hard charging uh, Lieutenant Colonel Perillo or whatever, this is some, some Italian name. He wanted me and my guys with our uh, 117s to go be radio relay in the city. I'm like, you know, sir, respectfully, that's not what we do. Right? Yeah. You don't put a brain surgeon on guard duty. Right, right. And he's like, well, you're not going to work with us. We don't need to feed you. I'm like, excuse me? Like, how's that work? So we couldn't get food from... From there, you know, we couldn't go draw it. So obviously, you know, we, we do have a separate chain of command, right? You understand how this works. I'm here working with you, but I don't work for you. Right, right. You're not my boss, right? You're not my real dad. <laughs> so it, so they're, they're like, all right, well, definitely, we, let's get Higgins out of here because he's going to probably choke someone. Like, yeah. And it could be the commander. Yeah. Um, so we fly back and we land, uh, well, I land. Back, I'm I'm living I'm living here in, in Washington. I land in Seattle Sunday, May twelfth, Mother's Day, same day that they had a big uh, assault on a on a, a expat compound in, in Riyadh. I don't you know a lot of people don't don't remember that or you know it got washed away in the news. But the second crew of guys that was coming was in Germany and got turned around. They're like, oh, nope, shit's kicking off, boys. Come on back. And those bastards were there for the insurrection that started, for all that nonsense, and were there for another six months. Jeez. Yeah. So, once again, I lucked out. Yeah. 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 So, pretty happy about how that turned out. No doubt. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of guys that uh, I worked with, a guy who who had that happen to him. He was uh, getting ready. They had been there for like 12 or 13 months, was getting ready to come home, and they're like, nope, you got to turn around, boys. And they landed again. He stayed another, I think, I want to say six months. He was there. He was there a crazy amount. Of yeah, time. yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, I don't. I just. I mean, I don't want to. I don't like. I said I don't want to get on a soapbox again, but I, I don't get that. Like, you. That just seems like to demoralize. You know, that just it's just a very. Oh. You know what I mean? It's like it's almost bad leadership. Dude, just of, just know? just think about just think about any any deployment you've been on. Yeah. Where. They, they right or wrong or indifferent, they tell you, listen, this is the day we're, we're going home. Yeah. 
And, you know, that's the day you count on. And then, well, I mean, not that day. It's going to be this day. You're like, well, shit, man. You know? Well, kind of like you were saying before, I'd rather they just didn't tell me. You know, like just say. Yes. Hey, yep. You know, you're here yep. for four or five months. We don't know when you're going home. Just just, yep. get, just get get comfortable. You know, it's like, okay, yep. I'm good. I'm good. Hey, what are you doing today? Uh, hang on. Let me cancel that. Hey, buddy, I'm on a call. I got to call you back. That's my son. Okay. Important. Yeah. Uh, that is the greatest achievement I've ever done in my life. My son was 10 days old. He died in my kitchen. Uh, I was holding him. He wasn't breathing. And I resuscitated him. By the time uh, EMTs got there, you know, he's breathing, squawking, crying. Uh, oh God. Yeah. What was the deal? Now did he's. He, he, so he had, uh, they say, you know, they say he had a febrile seizure, but he was coughing and spitting up. And he basically coughed up the mucus lining of his stomach. And uh, uh, it plugged his airway. Oh. And so, you know, you think about this little, I mean, he was tiny, right? And he's 10 days old. He's just a little sure. baby. And his mouth is open like he's still screaming, but there's no sound coming out. And he's watching him and he goes blue. And then he goes limp. And he's not breathing. Oh my God. You know? What yeah. Yeah. Here's the here's the Paul Harvey on that one. I was supposed to go to drill that weekend. And it was gonna be a long one because we were doing uh winter warfare training on the backside of Mount Rainier. You know, only way to reach you is by HF. And, you know, that, that depends on somebody actually paying attention to the base station back at Camp Murray. Right. And so Friday night, I had called my commander. You know, this is me, right? Much younger, not aware of the thing called Family Medical Leave Act. So baby's nine days old. I'm like, hey, is there any way I could skip drill this month? And they're like, uh, yes, dumb dumb. <laughs> yes, you can skip drill. <laughs> I'm like, cool, that's awesome. Thanks, sir. I owe you. And he's like, no, you don't. Yeah, it's the law. Right. Like, oh, okay, thanks. You know, so uh, so the next morning, you know, Mama's all happy. I'm gonna be there. Uh, she makes me biscuits and gravy, fried eggs, bacon. It's gonna be amazing. And then little man, and uh, if I know that if I had not been there, um, he'd be dead because my ex-wife just does not. She she. She folds faster than Superman on laundry day, right? So, uh, thank God. But there, anyway, yeah. he's alive. Yeah, and then EMT, right? So these little bastards. So they come into the house, right? And they're checking on him. And I had used a bulb syringe to suck out whatever I could and back blows and all that. And and, uh, and he's he's alive and he's breathing and he's squawking. And so they were like, well, you know, step aside. We got this. So they they got my son and they got the bulb syringe and they're checking his nose and doing all that. And where are they emptying it? My plate of food that's on the counter. Assholes. Not the sink that's right next to it. You got to do it into my fucking biscuits and gravy. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, man. Like, that's, come on, dude. Come on. I've already saved the kid. Come you're on. not doing anything. Like, just have some yeah, common like, Hey, now you're just being a dick? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> come on. Anyway, those God, things stick with so you, right? Like, oh man, I, I got I have four kids, so like any time anything ever happened with them, you know, I, I can't imagine what you were going through mentally. Just like uh, it's it's it. Well, I'll tell you, I'll point. tell you that uh, that's awesome. Yeah, well, you know when it, when it was happening, like it's just like okay, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to you know check, you know, and it was it was later because I stayed with him um, in the hospital. Uh, my my ex wife went home. Because we had his older sister, right? I mean, you can't sure. like somebody's got to yeah. watch her too, right? Right. So uh, I stayed. I just, just sitting there, just watching them, and 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 all the you know, it's all just like it's there's nobody there. Man, I lost my shit. Yeah. I probably cried for an hour just yeah. thinking about yeah. So. But that's what you do. I mean, anyway. uh, you know, we hope, yeah. we hope we all react in that way that. When there's a, a situation at hand, we keep, we keep our composure, right. you know, deal with it. And then later on we lose it. You know, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's what we try to right. do. Yeah. Yep. Well, good on you, man. That's awesome. So, yeah. 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 He's my, he's my, he's my pride and joy. So I have four kids too. Right. So I've got, uh, I've got an older daughter who, who lives well. So her, her husband is, uh, joined the, he, he joined 19th group and he's down at, uh, Infantry AIT at, uh, you know, Benning, now Camp Moore, which that's really the only one that I agree with, right? Because Moore was a badass. 
Al Moore there was, was a, a um, I think the only other one was like, uh, I think Rucker, I think the name of that one is uh, like some badass helicopter pilot or something. I can't remember exactly. Oh, is it? Yeah, so I don't, did they change Rucker? Of course uh, I think did. so, yeah. But yeah, yeah I, Liberty I even, is pretty. The guys at work, we don't even call them by the new names. We're just like Bragg, Benning. No. We, it's we always been Bragg, right? Yeah. I don't know if I'll ever try. Yeah, to are they going to? They going to? They did change it to Fort Liberty Boulevard? No, Bragg Boulevard. So I mean, weird. come on, man. I know. You know, they got rid of Ricks, so there's no C-section scars or you know amputees <laughs> dancing on the pole down there. But <laughs> right. God, could it still be Bragg? Can we still call it Bragg? I don't know. I yeah, don't know. you might offend somebody. Yeah. Do. Probably. Right. Anyway, so he's so he's gone. So she she was at, they were living in Georgia where I live, uh, and then when he joined. She uh, came home to be with the mom because we have a one-year-old grand. Well, I have a one-year-old grandson. She has a one-year-old son. Oh, nice. So that's yeah. So that's partly why I'm out here this weekend. Oh, cool. That and I'm collecting intel for the resistance. You know, on the <laughs> right. communist Washington. Exactly. So, so, uh, so anyway. what? Uh, yeah. So tell me, is this about the time you got your commission, or how, where are we at on that? It, yeah. It, so so. Uh, so the guard was leading the way on that, right? They had the non-rated ALO program. Oh, right. Uh, right. And yeah. And so it was, it was it basically, it was a, it, it was a made up uh, position. If you, if you looked, I think I, I was a 16 golf. And if you look in the big book of AFSCs, it, it comes it's air staff officer or something. It's just okay. generic. Right. But, sure. but it was a means to an end, but it was a hybrid, right? So it was rank captain major. You could never promote above. So it wasn't truly viable, right? They still had to have that rated pilot to tell us how to be adults. Um, you know, don't touch a radio, sir, but yeah, tell me how to live my life. Got it. <laughs> yeah. uh, right, right. Yeah. So I went to uh, I went to, to AMS, the Academy of Military Science at, at uh, McGee Tyson Air Base in Tennessee. And uh, the first night there, the guy who was my roommate was just struggling, right? He's... You know, a lot of people are just, they're just weak. And I thought, let me just get this kid to quit, right? Then I have a room to myself. <laughs> then I thought, but I also have to clean the whole room myself. Yeah. How you doing, buddy? What can I do to help you, right? Well, the guy graduates. Good for him. He gets commissioned. But the night before, <laughs> night before graduation, um, the, you know, we, we go out to the little bar, um, you know, the NCO club or whatever it is. And uh, we're, we're, we're having a few beers and people are sitting around and they're like, what's your first memory of being here? And people are talking about, well, you know, I was getting yelled at and all this nonsense. Right. And they're like, what about you, Conan? And I'm like, well, and I point to him. I'm like, I remember you crying and thinking to myself, I should just I should just help you quit. And then I'll have the room to myself. But then I, I'm going to have to clean it myself. And he looks at me. And you can tell that, like, I, you know, here, I should not be saying this out loud. <laughs> I've never heard from the guy again, right? Never heard from him again. Um, yeah. Uh, so, oops, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Mm. yeah. Hope your career is great. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yes, I got, I got commissioned and uh, I had this whole pipeline of training. I'm like, well, I'm a new officer, right? So I need to go to this and I need to go to that. And, and one of the things that I needed to go to was ALO QC. Well, in those days, it was unit funded. So they're like, Higgins, you are not sending, but look at this lit. What are they going to teach you? No, no, we're not sending you any of this. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. Never mind. Mm-hmm. Years later, uh, I'm, I'm at the, the one four great in Fort Indian Town Gap and uh, with with uh, Scott Ball. Did you know T-Ball? I don't think so. No. I think I've, I think Aaron I've Gibbs. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of guys that, that used to be on active duty that, that you know, just came and, and got an AGR job and kind of finished their 20, but in the guard, so they weren't PCSing anymore. Nate Hoff was another one. He had come to the fifth right after I left, or I guess we might have overlapped or whatever. But anyway, the whole point is I'm out there, and uh, they're like, hey, uh, you know, uh, Lieutenant Higgins, or I guess I was captain by then. They're like, Captain Higgins, um, you know, we, we're missing some of your certificates. And I'm like, for what? They're like, well, you know, JFCC and ALO QC. And I'm like, yeah, well, I went to JFCC in 96. and I never went to ALO QC. And they're like, you didn't? Why not? And I'm like, what the hell are they going to teach me? Right? Echoing what I was told years ago. And they're like, oh, well, do you want to go? I said, it's in Vegas now, right? And they're like, yeah. I said, 
okay, yeah, <laughs> I'll go for three weeks to Vegas. Right. You know, I mean, it's pretty pretty easy job, right? So sure, sure. I go, you know, I gotta I gotta shave, I gotta put on a uniform. I, I did that, and and uh, you know, it, I mean, who's running the courses? Chris Ostrowskis, you know, Chris Deaver. I mean, buddies, right, that I grew up with. So, like, this isn't a course. This is homecoming. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'll go sit in there and listen to this guy tell me what I already know, and hopefully I'll, I'm not snoring too loud. But, okay. And then, like, well, you know, and so they had some officers in there. As, you know, I don't know why. Well, probably because, you know, now we have kids coming up, fresh lieutenant, you know, 13 Limas and all that. Right, right. And, uh, and so, like, hey, Higgins, listen, you know, you're – you got a great opportunity here to be a role model to some of these lieutenants, but they can see you're not taking this seriously. And I looked at them and I said, Hey, why would I like, why would I take this class seriously when I've known this stuff for decades? Yeah. Like, well, if you could really, you know, if you could just show some effort, I'd be fine. Hmm. So the next test I got, I got a hundred percent. Right. Hmm. And uh, they're like, Oh, that's really great. I'm like, yeah. Um, you know, the reason I don't get hundreds and all of these, because I, I take them in about three minutes while everyone has an hour. Yeah. And sometimes I don't read the full question. Right. Yeah. So that didn't work out the way they wanted either. But anyway, I did get commissioned. I did go to these schools. I did uh, become an officer and and tried to be the, the guy that we didn't have when I was a young enlisted dude. Right. Yeah. Looking out for the guys, being the voice of reason, being the shit screen, you know, that kind of, you know, stuff that our NCOs would do for us, but, you know, only had so much effectiveness because, at best, they were an E9, right? Right. I mean, at best. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I did that. And then my last two years in uh, in uniform, I, I, I was gone. I uh, had a chance to go work in, in, uh, in Qatar uh, as a civilian. And my my boss, uh, Zulu, Stacy Zanavage, was, was the commander. I said, listen, I've, I've done all my drills for the year. This is like June. Mm. And I said, I've done all my drills for the year. Uh, can I go do this? And, you know, I'll be gone for a year and I'll come back and I'll do all the drills. And he's like, that's fine. Go for it. So I did. And as that year was coming to an end, we were making a lot of progress. And uh, I'm talking to him. And he says, well, listen, stay there for another year if you want, because I'm going to uh, the command the war college in residence. I'm like, congrats. He says, yeah, so I'll see you next year. I'm like, awesome stay there and at the end of that year i had helped to uh uh we we concluded the first public private partnership with the qatari government in the space we we're building humane and compliant labor accommodations for migrant workers there yeah uh, and we got concessions to build forty-four thousand beds now these are planned communities right they're not just like dormitories they got everything right they're little cities but nice. it was four hundred and fifty million dollars. Uh, it was was the deal plus the public private partnerships. Pretty good in two years, I thought. Right. Yeah. Then I hear from the uh, from the DO. He's like, "Hey, um, Higgins, give me a call." Right. He sends me an email. Call him up. I'm like, "What's up?" He says, um, "You're getting a referral OPR." I said, "Refer to what?" He says, "No, no, it's a referral OPR." I said, "Great. What what is that?" Yeah. He says, well, it's a negative OPR. I said, "Negative for what?" He says, "Well, you're you're deficient in medical, dental, and a PT test." I said, well, Come dude, on. I'm right down the road from Al UD. Just put me on orders. I'll go knock this out tomorrow. He says, I can't. Why not? Because you're deficient on medical, dental, and a PT test. We can't put you on orders if you're deficient in those. I said, you've got to be kidding me. I said, 24 and a half years, right? Now, I only did have one good conduct medal, right? And you're supposed to get those every three years. And right. Clearly, there was a reason I didn't. <laughs> but I didn't have any negative shit either that stuck. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and here, you know, at the end of, of a pretty, pretty decent career, you're going to do this because I, I didn't show up for medical because I'm fucking overseas. Like, that's what I'm not yeah. doing that. And he said, what do you mean? I said, oh, I'm just going to retire. And it's a little different in the guard, right? Because they have their succession picked. Right? Here's a commander. He's going to go easy. He's going to retire. He's going to move up. The DO is going to take that job. The ADO is going to take his job. Well, you know, I'm in that progression. And I say, screw it, I'm, I'm retiring. And that was not what they wanted to hear because it's like they realize, I mean, the policy, I get it, right? You get some people who are in the, in the guard and they're scamming and they're skirting out because they're fat or their teeth suck or they're just, you know, they're unhealthy. I, mean, I don't know why you'd skip medical and dental other than that. 
but I'm not that guy, right? Like I'm, you know, that you're punishing me because I'm, I'm, I'm bettering my life. I'm out here as a, I'm an attorney. This is, I'm doing international business law for Pete's sake, right? This is what I right. went to school to do. So, uh, I, so I, I try to retire and I'm trying to log in from halfway around the world. And if you've ever tried to log into a military, anything remotely, uh, it's like Chinese algebra, man. It's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. So, so I, I, I finally get logged in and my thought was my, my date of, of entry was September 14th, 1990. So I am going to retire 25 years to the day, September 14th. The problem is it's now March 15th in Qatar. So I can't. Because it's 179 days, you get you, under 180 days. You have to get a waiver for a rapid retirement. So I've missed it by like two hours. Jeez, right? <laughs> just, I mean, the, the hits just keep coming. So I, so I said, well, hold on. <clears throat> My birthday is September 17th. I'll retire with 25 years and three days. Okay, no problem. So my unit. Um, was going to have a, a pretty good retirement for me. They were going to be in uh, shorts, flip-flops, Hawaiian shirts. They'd gotten, uh, the commander had, had said, boys, you got a month. You need to, you need to grow your beards out. Higgins, you know, they, I mean, they were basically, they were, they were honoring me, right? Sure. And I, I, yeah. And I screwed that up because I invited, among others, Jim Hotailing, who was at the time the chief of the air guard, Right. I invited oh. uh, retired Major General <laughs> Dutch Remkes, who had been the head of the air expeditionary uh, wing in Afghanistan. And I knew him working civilian stuff. So that's yeah. a two star. I, I invited uh, retired Ambassador Joe LeBaron, who in his career had been the uh, State Department liaison to SOCOM. And I invited my good personal friend who baptized my, my kids, uh, Paul Hurley, class of 85, West Point, who was now the two-star Army Chief of Chaplains to provide the invocation for my retirement. The holy shit, oh dear, what went from Hawaiian shirts and flip-flops and beards, it went to blues and clean-shaven and like I totally screwed myself. Totally screwed myself. Oh. I mean, they had to protocol people, you know, it was going to be in the, it was going to be oh, in the motor yeah, bay with sure, a keg yeah. right there and beers in hand as they're reading the thing. And yeah, that's out the window. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. We had more stars than, than the night sky. Right. So <laughs> and we would retire lot. generals. Come on. Yeah. Just, it, I screwed that up. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, that's something we glossed over. You, uh, you um, became a lawyer during this time. Like we, I, th I don't think we mentioned that uh, since then. So, you got your, yeah. you became a lawyer and then you, yeah, that was, it was really cool that that thing you were talking about is like, uh, tell me more about that. Like what, so what was the, what, who were you building these, uh, the, the, the migrant workers? Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, well, uh, so I did, I remember I, you know, I had the day job and, and, uh, so I, I went from the state patrol to the city of Lakewood here when they stood up their own police department Okay. and, uh, and I, I was a detective and uh, I mean, I worked undercover and, you know, I mean, we were just talking about this last night. My old, my old, the other reason I'm here other than to see my, uh, my grandson and my daughter and, you know, uh, have, have a few times with, with old buddies. Uh, my, my partner, my old detective partner is, uh, he's getting baptized on the tomorrow. So he asked me to come out. Okay. Cool. So I'm out. That's cool. Well, back in the day, um, I was also uh, on the SWAT team. I was, I was an entry team leader for the Metro SWAT team. Nice. Uh, we had three entry teams. We had red, green, and blue. Red team, the guy was, you know, former ranger instructor. Green team, the guy was first group, and then he was at 19th group. He's Green Beret. So you get the nomen nomenclature here. Yeah. Uh, and then blue team, because of me, right? So uh, we're standing uh, in the rain for about four hours waiting to make entry on this house where uh, this guy, had, he'd shot his baby mama in the face while she was holding their 10 day old, two week old kid. Yeah. I mean, just like, that's your solution. Right. I'm not a proponent for domestic violence, but like you couldn't just push her, slap her. I mean, you had to shoot her. That's the, that's the decision. Okay. Got it. All right. So you know, and this is, this is in uh, 2005. 
you know, most of us had kids, young kids at the time. Um, and, you know, it's not hard to picture your kid being, there, you know, right. So everybody wants to give this guy a good dose of wood shampoo. Sure. And, uh, but, you know, you're, you're waiting to make entry. It's 38 degrees. It's, it's just that steady pissing down rain that this, that Pacific Northwest is known for. And you're not talking, right? You're in your head. And I, I, like, I do not want to do this when I'm 40. This is, this is nonsense. Yeah. And so I made the decision to go to law school during that time. And, and, uh, uh, and so I did. So <clears throat> I, I, I went to law school for, uh, so if you go full-time, it's three years. If you go part-time, it's four years. But I took a year off after my first year to deploy back to Afghanistan. I was my penance to her as a lieutenant. And uh, uh, I, when I came back from that, I was out of the, the, the groove. So I, I, I told myself, I'm never doing that again. And uh, I continued to, to deploy, but as a contractor. And so I just shipped all my books. And uh, I mean, I, I, there's a picture of me. I got to find it, uh, of me studying federal tax law under a poncho with a red lens flashlight up in the corn and gold. That's back in 2009. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in the fall of 2009, I was in the Philippines. Uh, so I was working some special access programs. Uh, and and we were, we were uh, in the special projects group. And down in the Philippines, the head of that was this SEAL. Well, Typhoon Ondoy was a big one. There was a tsunami in Samoa that it caused. And Manila was wrecked. And so his SEAL buddies up at the embassy are like, dude, you got to get up here, man. And... Uh, so he says, all right, we're packing up, get, we're going, and we, we're going to be gone for a week. And I'm like, okay, let's go. And we go up there, and, and uh, we were in Zodiacs, and we were gaff-hooking bodies and just kind of passing them off to the Phil police that were in the Boston Whaler behind us. And the boat was – like, they could not put any more people in the boat, right? So they're just tying them off and dragging them behind. It's pretty nasty. Yeah. And uh, there was one um, – you know, we could see kind of floating – and with a rope tied around the waist, as we as we started pulling them, uh, pulling, it was a kid, and uh, and and as we got the kid, it's tied to another kid, and oh tied to another God. kid, and tied to mom, and tied to dad. Oh. And dad had gotten sucked down and had dragged them all to their death. Jeez. Yeah, dude. It's, yeah. Brutal. So that was it, horrible, oh. horrible. Yeah. Uh, and it just, you talk about, so, you know, like the people who say, oh, we'll sit around, drink beers and tell lies. I'm like, bro, I don't, I don't, I don't need to tell lies. Right. These stories, people don't believe this shit anyway. Right. Yeah. Hollywood wouldn't buy the script. They're like, tone it down a bit. <laughs> but we literally pulled the Zodiac up to our hotel because the steps are underwater. So you just yeah. tie off and walk into the lobby with your nasty, happy, because think about it right now. It's an open sewer, it, oh, right? It's God, flooded. Yeah. What's, what's floating around, right? The, 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 oh, the stink man. pickles and the you know finless brown wrinkle fish as we used to call them right i mean that just you know there goes another candy bar wait that's not a candy oh. bar baby oh. Ruth. yeah dude it's nasty i mean it's man, your clothes are just gross and oh. what are you gonna do i mean yeah, you, gotta, you gotta do it get yeah. out so just it, so um one of the places that had power was this iranian place this this uh, restaurant uh <laughs> so we, we go in there and and uh very limited menu they had warm beer, but they had beer. They had hookah, and they had sheep brains with what, some what kind of brains? Sheep. Oh, sheep. Okay. Lamb. Gotcha, yeah, sheep. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, brains. So How we had that? a plate of. I mean, okay, it's like cold, greasy eggs yeah. is what it tasted like. Yeah. Uh, it just, you know, little bread, little beer, little hookah, back into the Zodiac to get back to the hotel. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't even know how I got on that subject, but that was, uh, uh, you know, deploying That's with as a, as a contract for the company Blackbird Technologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, as a matter of fact, I came back from that and uh, Blackbird was having their Christmas party in, in December of 09. And I, uh, I went up to my boss and i said hey um you know i'm about to finish law school and uh i i haven't like i don't i've never i haven't done an internship i haven't done anything right like i'm not gonna get hired by anybody yeah. so blackbird actually created an internship for me 
paid internship. I came out, uh, was there for six weeks and did a good enough job that the, the uh, general counsel, who was the same age as me, oddly enough, right? Uh, he says, listen, uh, if, I, if I had a spot for you, I'd hire you tomorrow, but I don't. So, you know, have fun in Afghanistan. <laughs> and off I went, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm finishing that up in, in February of 11 now. Because uh, December of 09, internship in June of 10, back to Afghanistan. Now it's February of 11. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had said, hey, you know, let me know when you get back. You know, you, we could always use help doing legal research or whatever. And I, you know, like, hey, I mean, I've graduated. So I sent him an email, said, hey, I'm, I'm going to be uh, coming coming back to the States in a, in a few weeks. And just, if there's any projects I can help with. And he says, give me a call. I call him up and he says, how would you like to be our newest lawyer in the legal department? Uh, Yes, please. Yeah. But that means I got back. I got back and uh, told my wife we're moving, and we did. And I, I mean, we we drove cross country uh, in her Chevy Traverse because uh, she had given away my truck while I was gone. That was awfully nice of her. There's a reason she's my second ex. Well, there's many reasons. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, so we we drive cross country and and drop me off. She flies back and. Uh, you know, there I am, a brand new lawyer, and here we go. And that lasted for a year and a day, uh, but the the beauty of the leap year, it was actually the same date that I started there. I uh, I, I resigned, and uh, I'm not a cubicle dweller. That's not me, right? And come to find out, the the security guys in the building. Uh, for the company had a pool. They had an office pool to see how long I would make it. Because right? the tiger's in the cage now. How long is he going to stay in the cage? Yeah. And I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, how, that doesn't seem nobody like, had all over six months. Done, like to, yeah. you, to put you in that situation, this seems out of character. You know, I was like, well, I mean, what? I, yeah, I, okay, he's cool. But he's a lawyer. Might as well put it to good use. But I was like, man, that's that's well, not what he's used to. Well, and and yeah, and 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 so I had I'd, I'd gone back to school. Uh, in September of 11 to the University of Liverpool in England. And I was doing that mostly by correspondence, you know, some some uh, visitation, you know, in, in person stuff. But uh, that was to get uh, an advanced legal degree in international business law. Nice. And uh, my thought was that if you're going to get any international anything and you do it here in the States, all you're learning is how to do it as an American, right? It's not right. really international. You can figure that out just by going and doing by yourself. Right. But getting it from another school, especially an English school. And by the way, the University of Liverpool is uh, it's in the Russell Group, which here we would call it the Ivy League, right? So it's oh, a good okay. school. It's a very good school. Uh, but you know, they obviously the Brits have a different way of looking at the world, and it's more of a you know uh, clearly it's non-U.S. centric. So how they play well with others, and you know blah blah blah, right? Mm. Well, the the Brits also have a certain cachet in the Middle East in terms of their legal because. You know, all the Middle East was a British mandate for up until, you know, the 60s or 70s. Right. So. Uh, so I did that and I thought, you know, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to be working in Europe and it's going to be great. Yeah. But there are already lawyers in Europe that know how to be lawyers in Europe. So that, that there's not real pathway there, Higgins. <laughs> And just out of luck, a buddy of mine was uh, was doing a project in uh, Juba, South Sudan, and he said, "Hey, could you go down and help me do a full risk analysis of this uh, project?" And I said, "Sure." And I went down there, and you know, during the course of it, I'm I'm asking just questions. I'm like, "All right, so so how what family are we working with here, and how are we getting the land?" And, and just asking the questions, they start putting me in, in touch, and you know, we end up getting that deal, and they built a hotel in in Juba. Uh, for all the NGOs that were going in there. Um, but that job led me to uh, talk to uh, the, the principals behind that project, said, hey, come to Doha. So I went to Qatar and, and uh, they said, um, listen, this is what we're doing. And what were they doing? Well, this is in 13, the spring of 13. And uh, Qatar had just been awarded the World Cup for 22. Right. And so, you know, there were, you know, stories abound about the, how they actually won that. 
Um, and most of them involve manila envelopes under the table type thing. But, <laughs> yeah. but the, the British press went bananas on the human rights violations that were happening in, in Qatar and, and specifically with uh, these migrant workers, right? Mm -hmm. So migrant workers, are anyone who's coming and going, Right. We're migrant workers. We're just we, but, you know, because we're educated and professionals, we're we're called expats. Right. But sure. same thing. You know, we don't we don't live there. They don't want us to live there. They want us to come in and be the help and then get out. Right. Uh, now, the the unskilled workers. They had them in absolute squalid conditions. Uh, you could smell those uh, those camps before you saw them. They were so nasty. And uh, I mean, human trafficking is, is real. And I'm not talking about Hollywood sex stuff. I'm talking about debt bondage. I'm talking about these guys getting recruited in their home countries by their countrymen. Right. Hey, I got this job. It's going to pay a thousand reals a month. That's a big pot of money for a kid your age coming out of Nepal. Um, it starts Tuesday. And the kid's like, oh, that's awesome. But I, I don't I, I don't have any airfare. You know, I don't have money. I can't I can't get there. Like, no, 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 no. We, we'll get you. We'll get you there. You will just pay us back out of your first check. No problem. You're like, oh, thanks. So they get on the plane, right? And they get handed their form and they said, uh, yeah, here's your contract. Sign it. And they're looking it over and they're, you know, um, it says, uh, it says 500, not, not a thousand. It was supposed to be a thousand. They're like, oh, well, you know, if you don't want it, we, when we land, just, just get on a plane and go home and you can just pay us the airfare, you know, when you get home. Well, dude didn't have any money to leave. Right. So how's he going to have money when he gets home? He's not. So he's like, oh, okay, he signs it. So this is, so now he's on the hook. Now he's on the ground and they collect up the passports because we're going to get you your visas so you can be here, your work visas. Mm -hmm. But they never give them their passport reports back. So these guys can't leave. Okay. What, what's that called? But slavery, right? Yeah, yeah, Human yeah. trafficking, it's debt bondage. Yeah. The guy is in debt. Kidnapping, He's in bondage yeah, because kidnapping. of the debt, right? Okay, so now it's payday, right? Guy's like, well, you know, 500 isn't a lot, but I can still send some home and, you know, and pay this guy a little bit every month and whatever. And so a guy walks up with 200 reals. And he's like, what, but, it's, but it's supposed to be five. He goes, let me see that real quick. Takes it, puts it in his pocket, says, see you next month, and leaves. Now the guy is zero. And they have to pay for their own food. They got to, they got to, they, they have to like how, so they're trying, you know, and everybody's been in that position. Everybody knows, you know, new guys getting screwed over. And so they, you know, would try to help them. But this is why you had 18, 19 year old kids dying of heart attack. Right? Their, their electrolytes are all off. They're not eating. They're not sleeping. They're stacked in there like cordwood. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolute horrible conditions. So coupled with the negative press from, uh, from Britain, the Emir, not the current one, not uh, not to me, but his dad uh, had invited the, this uh, this guy and uh, and Joe LeBaron, who was uh, who was at my retirement, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. to come in and consult and you know fix the problem. Well, the Qatar Foundation, which is a quasi government entity, had published these uh, guidelines for labor accommodations. Right? We don't call them labor camps. Hitler had labor camps. We know how that turned out. These are accommodations. These are our guests. Okay. Well, they, and, and you know what? They, they, there's some things maybe we take for granted here in the West, right? Like personal space, lockable personal space, right? So you can put your passport yeah. in there, lock it, and it's safe. Um, you know, food every day, clean water, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but these people couldn't. People couldn't figure out how to do it, right? Like, okay, you're telling me what I need to do, but I can't picture how it fits together. And so we hired this guy, Stan Zippen, who was a Canadian guy, but he had helped to write these. And so he developed what we call the DNA of this project. And the DNA revolved around the basic living unit, right? You could have so many living units per floor. And we only went up to three floors because if you went any higher, you had to put in elevators and that's, you know, that's expense, right? And maintenance and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so we, we had this whole thing figured out. Um, we, we started with an 8,000 bed, uh, facility, right. And, and that, that is like a small town because yeah. it's got, uh, uh, worship places to worship for these guys. And really does, it does depend. I mean, you have to segregate, uh, based on ethnicity. You also have to change the food. 
based on ethnicity, right? Nobody's going to eat gringo food, right? And the, the, the guys from Nepal are not eating the same stuff that the people from Pakistan are eating or necessarily, right? right? Or from the Philippines or wherever. So it, it got quite involved. And that 8,000 bed uh, facility launched that public-private partnership because we were seeking to get more buy-in. And we ended up doing a uh, 36,000 uh, bed city in the north of, of Qatar, up near uh, Ras al Khaimah. And, you know, the government comes in and like, well, now, if you're going to be up there and we're going to do this, we want you to put in a regional hospital. Okay. Not cheap. Yeah. We had water reclamation you know, because it's a desert, right? Yeah. And so, but, but, but see, this is the beauty of it. Uh, Hitachi was the company that we went with for that solution. And, uh, the, it was so good at, at, at saving, reclaiming uh, the water and purifying. I mean, you could drink it. I'm like, I, I'll take your word for it, but you could drink it, right? Uh, but 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 the, the the migrant workers wouldn't. They would rebel, right? So what could you do with it? You could put it in the toilets, right? You could uh, uh, use it for irrigation, like for the green space. But then you okay. still have all this work. You can't put it in the sinks. You can't put it in the showers. If they find out, you know, they're, they're bathing with poop water, even though it's chemically and biologically inert, they will revolt, right? Okay. So what do we do with all this extra water? We're in a desert. Food, food, uh, uh, growing food and, and food protection production is a, is, it's, a, it's a national concern. So the okay. Qataris have these farms that, where they're trying to grow food, right? It's food security. But we sold them the water. Great. We had more than we needed. Perfect. Um, so it was just, it, it was very involved. I mean, we had yeah, smart yeah. access. Everybody got, uh, they got a, an ID card, right? And that ID card was coded to you. So you got your meals that way. You could go get a haircut with that. You could, you know, get into your building and then only to your floor and then only to your room. Um, we had, we had, you know, overlapping cameras so there was no blind spots where you know people get dragged in raped and robbed or whatever people do these are really like open air prisons honestly they're pretty nice but they're not allowed to leave they can't leave yeah the, Qatar, the qataris don't want these guys walking the streets you know no you get on your get on your camp and stay there um so that that's it in a nutshell but that's pretty cool though i mean it, it's it's exponentially better than it was before i mean it, you guys definitely did a a service for those guys to yeah, I mean, and, and we, we were, I mean, we were really kind of the, the first ones to crack the code. Uh, but then, you know, but then other people were getting on board and you, and you have to, right? If you, if you want the guy to actually produce for you, it, it's remarkable how much better of a job they do when they're rested and well-fed, right? you know, they versus, probably understood versus that clinging to life. Yeah. You know, they saw well, that. But, but you know what? But when, when we started these negotiations and we had people in the Qatari government who were like, these people come from places without electricity. Who cares? Getting that mentality changed. I mean, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, you know, you, like it was it was definitely it was an uphill battle no doubt. just to, to get them to buy into basic human rights. So and then we worked with an ethical recruiter, too. Who knows who was taking the money to you? The guy could have been. That could have been a low level dude, just like saying, ah, "I'm just going to pocket this 200 and you know, or the 300 or whatever." And it's just so involved, oh. in so many moving pieces, and so many shady dudes that are probably involved. I mean, absolutely, everybody's yeah. trying to get their piece. Yeah. Everybody's trying to get their piece. So, yeah. Good so we, you, I started to say we, we we worked we worked with a, a company, an ethical recruiting company. Uh, and here's my you know book on the wrong shelf. I'm trying to remember the name of that company. You know, what's an, what's an ethical recruiting company? Well, it's somebody who doesn't go in and do the bait and switch, right? It's not the, hey, come to work for us and you can pay us back. It's like, here's the deal. You sign the contract before you even leave the country. So you know exactly what you're getting into, right? right? And, uh, you know, there's, there's none of the bait and switch or screwing them over or any of that stuff. And, and that was important. And they have an uphill battle because, you know, it, it costs more and it's a slower process. But all in all, it was a good idea. And you have to change the, like you said, you have to change the mentality. Those guys don't, they're just, they have the idea right. that just, if I just get a bunch of workers here and just force them to work, it'll be fine. But it's like, well, dude, you don't understand. You can, yes, that will work for a little bit and maybe your productivity will be kind of good, but 
if you treat these people correctly and you give them what they need, right. they're going to work a heck of a lot harder. I mean, that's leadership one on one right there. You know that. You know, yeah, yeah. But here's but here's the problem too. So this ethical recruiter, right? So the number is still a thousand reals a month, right? The ethical ethical recruiter says we will pay you eight hundred because we're going to take two hundred off the top to pay for our airfare that we're getting you there, right? So the guys like, well, I'm only eighty at eight hundred. These guys are telling me I can get a thousand or twelve hundred. Well, those are the shitheads that are going to get you on the plane and then screw you, you know? Right, so right. yeah, of course. I mean, I can promise you the moon. You know, so it's just, it, it, it's, uh, I, I still look back. I mean, it was a good thing, but I, I came home and uh, that's when I uh, got linked up with um, Black Rifle Coffee. So in, uh, in March of 15, I was knighted by Prince Hermius, uh, Haile Selassie's grandson. He's the president of the Ethiopian Crown Council. Lives in D.C. Wow. He's got a, a African water project, bringing fresh water to the uh, highlands of, of Ethiopia. And uh, because of what we were doing with Hitachi and the water reclamation stuff, we were able to, to help out with that a little bit. And uh, and I also saved his cousin from maybe being eaten in Juba. Um, well, I mean that's sensational. But have you been to Africa? I mean, you're on the you're on the menu once you when you're on the ground, you're on the menu. Yeah. And everything wants to eat, right? So we we were in we were in Juba, and there's there's probably more pavement in your driveway than in, in that whole city at the time. So um, yeah, there's just areas that I mean, it's no different than a big city here. You don't you don't want to be there when the sun goes down, right? You need to be somewhere else. And this guy, great guy, uh, he's not picking it up. And so I'm like, hey, now what? We need to go. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm talking with my friend. And I'm like, uh, we need to go now. He's like, and I'm looking around and the people are, they're either going to rape or rob us or, or, or eat us or whatever, right? But they but definitely me, right? I, 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 you know, I don't blend. Sure. So they're like, let's, let's eat that guy and his little friend. And so I grabbed Awit heave him into the back of the car and it's right side drive and get in and we take off, get to the hotel, you know, say, sorry, we had to go. But the way he tells it is, you know, like I saved his life. <laughs> so anyway, so I did get knighted, but, uh, I reached out to, to JT and, uh, Evan, Evan Hafer at black rifle and asked, Hey, are you guys interested in Ethiopian coffee? And they said, absolutely. And this is, you know, the beginning of black rifle coffee. Right. I said, well, how about, uh, how about Jamaican Blue Mountain? He said, yeah, how do you know that? I said, well, there's a guy there named Rohan Marley, whose dad was Bob Marley, what? who, you know, they believe Haile Selassie is their god, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rastafarian, Ras means head or king, right? So Tafar was Haile Selassie's Ethiopian name, Ras, Tafar, king, Tafar. Oh. So a Rastafarian, they, right? They don't believe he's dead, by the way. Okay. <laughs> God doesn't die. Sure, sure. I'm not kidding. So, uh, so that's when that's when uh, you know Evan and, and JT were like, "Hey, why don't you come out to Salt Lake and let's sit down and talk about it?" So I did, and uh, um, you know, the rest is kind of history. I, I, they brought me on and, and some other people to help them stabilize the company. Uh, put in policies, processes, procedures to make it, you know, an, an actual business, not this, these guys hobby sure. and uh, brought on, you know, recapitalization and, and, and closed that deal. And the ink dried on December 1st of 17. And, uh, and, and then, you know, I stayed for about another six months, but I'm not the type, type of guy who, you know, can, can put my feet up on the desk and just collect the paycheck. Right. Like I need the, the, the challenge. I need the, the bar fighting side of, of legal business. So bit of a fond farewell, went over to, to uh, blue air training. If you're familiar with that company, yep. uh, they provide, you know, the close air support training for really all the JTACs now, unless you can get an active duty air airframe. Yeah. Uh, but chef Barlow, uh, Charlie Kebaugh, uh, you know, here's, here's yeah, a name that yeah. pops up out of the, out of the blue. Charlie was, uh, was helping run that company and years earlier in, in 16, uh, I, I had said, Charlie, you know, can I, can I do anything with that company? Like I'll come be a sensor operator. Right. And it was while I did that first trip to Vegas that I met chef, the owner. And he says, you know, so who are you? Tell me your story. And I basically gave him the condensed version. He said, wait a minute, you're an, you're an attorney. I said, yeah. And he said, Oh, well then I became their attorney. And so in 18, uh, 
your chef had cancer and he didn't want to tell anybody. He needed help running the company. So he brought me out to basically be his chief of staff while he was going through treatment and help him run the company. Nice. And uh, yeah, and we, um, I helped them to write and win a prime uh, position on the uh, 10-year, $7 billion IDIQ to provide red air and, and close air support training. An a, uh, a- AMCC contract. Yeah, well, you know, it, look, they, they, they won. They're a prime, but now you have to bid for each uh, task order, right? I mean, sure. the money's on the table. You have to figure out how to, how to, how to take it off there. Uh, but, but they did, obviously. But I helped them with that. And then in 19, you know, just, just about uh, and nine months, really, that I was in Vegas doing that for them. And then, like, I'm, I'm out, guys. You know, I don't – I mean, Chef is – he's on the mend. You know, it's in, it's in remission or whatever. And like, I'm not sitting here listening yeah. to daily nonsense. So that's what I do. And then uh, it's just – there were a couple other stops. I'm not, I'm not going to – I can get into those on the uh, on, on this call. Okay. Um, but uh, I'll tell you offline. And you'll know why I didn't bring it up here. But, uh, but now – uh, and let's go back to what I'd said about, you know, the paths we've taken and we haven't taken right now. Now I am working with my beer drinking bar fighting buddy from the Academy a guy named Mark Morales. He owns global ordinance, right? It's a multi-billion dollar company. I'm the general counsel for him. And, uh, I, 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 I'm here. I am all these years later. A little long in the tooth, a lot more gray, a little more snow on the roof. You know, not much of a roof anymore. You know, get that cut too many times. I mean, I grow back, but here I am. I'm with I'm with my buddy all these years later, helping him to run this company, and it's awesome. it's pretty awesome. What do yeah. they do? What's so Global Ordinance uh, is just that. Let me let me take you back. So, have you seen that movie War Dogs? Oh uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. So so that's you know the, the the facts behind that are it's a real story, right? Sure. Um, and those idiots did go to prison. And when they went to prison, that contract had to be relet. Mark picked it up. He still has it to this really? day. Oh, yeah. And he's, and, but it's a small, small P. I mean, he provides all the rocket fuel for SpaceX, right? I mean, this, this, and, and I'm like, dude, that's awesome. And he's like, eh, the margin's not that great. Like, Mark, <laughs> these go to space, right? Like, this right. is awesome. Okay. Let's, let's put it in, in focus here. Right. Um, but, but yeah. So, um, you know, we we're just down in soft week in Tampa last week. And, uh, have you ever been to one of those? I haven't uh, not. No, I'd like there, to these days for sure. Look, it is, they have a demonstration on Wednesday, um, uh, that is absolute boner fuel. I mean, it's fast boats coming in, mini guns blazing, yeah. uh, it, you know, little birds swooping in. They had, uh, the Marsoc guys on those ultralights, you know, flying in like Hamas and they had all this shit, right? They fast rope seals onto a boat and they, you know. They, they, anyway, right? So it's this whole scenario. Yeah. Okay. So not part of that demonstration were these guys in jetpacks that I'm telling you, this is Tony Stark shit right here, right? Yeah. These guys come swooping in like Iron Man and they're flying and they, and you know, I mean, they can land on a boat. If you can stand, you can land. And they literally, so only boats out in the water that weren't the military boats were the police boats, like the dive rescue, that case, you know, yeah. some wrong right well and they these guys i mean they're flying up and doing all this crazy shit and and then they land right next to us because we sell that stuff (laughs) yeah so there are there the 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 dutch uh special forces has 40 dudes trained on this and here's why they weren't part of the demonstration look here comes a helicopter hovers you know ropes dude dude right it's cool but let me tell you these guys on jetpacks would have swooped in landed shot everybody in the face swooped off and like the rest of the demonstration be like yay yeah like you know think about the flybys you used to see where you're you know you're like higher slower right it's boring as shit (laughs) right these guys would have ruined it right so um yeah Anyway, well, that's awesome. They, are they? they uh, uh, I mean, yeah. are they selling those or like mean, what's the what's the oh, market yeah. on this? Yeah, and wow. Yeah, I mean they they've sold uh, they've sold them to the to the Dutch. I mean, I don't want to get into everybody they've sold, but sure, sure. That's yeah. amazing. And you know, look, they they're not stealthy. You're going to hear them coming, but 
you're going to hear the helicopter, right? Sure. You're going to hear the fast boat. You're gonna, you, so we're, oh, we're yeah, coming or sure. we're not. Yeah. So. Um, and you're probably less of a target just being a one dude coming in as opposed to like a right. aircraft full of guys right. or a boat or something. Right. It's a few and you know what? There's a limited application because obviously a helicopter has a farther range than this little jet suit. Yeah. Um, that's, that's really what it is. But. But yeah, so Global Ordnance does that. There's also a couple other companies that I work with. Uh, one of them, Raven Advisory. Now, this is a cool story. You want to hear this one? Sure. So Raven Advisory is owned and run by uh, Sheffield Ford. He's a retired Green Beret. Uh, and I met him through an OGA buddy of mine back in 14, who they were looking for some legal advice and help on something. And and uh, this guy, Phil, said, hey, you got to meet my partner. Um, you know, come on and let's meet him. And He's telling me about Chef, and I realize, right, so set the Wayback Machine here to the summer of 2006 in Afghanistan, and uh, <clears throat> the kickoff of Op Medusa, which was huge, if you heard anybody about that, right? So I watched Juan Valentin running for his life on Pred Porn. This is my penance tour, right? So I'm a lieutenant, right? I'm a butter bar, right? But I, got my, I got my mustard stain, I my, you know, combat scroll, I got my combat SF patch. I mean, all that shit. Right. Yeah. So clearly if you're not total jackass, you'll look at this guy and be like, he's kind of old to be a Lieutenant. Oh, let me see the rest of the shit on his uniform. Okay. Probably he's been here before. Sure, sure. More on that in a sec, but I'm in, I'm in, uh, I'm in the jock and, uh, it's my first tick as a, you know, as a, as the siege of soda Velo. And, you know, we're just pushing air and these guys are in it. I mean, they're, they're, they're fighting for their life. Right. It's about two day fight. And we're pushing them air, pushing them air. Uh, uh, Fab Mahalik, right, t- was named after Tom Mahalik. He died in this fight. Oh. And uh, yeah, it's giving me goosebumps. Oh. Um, but the team leader for that team was Chef Ford. Really? Yeah. Wow. You see that, dude, dude. So dude. before I knew him, you know, I, I helped him. So, so that's something. So that's back to 06. Um, and, and, and Raven Advisory does a bunch of things. And they do a lot of uh, classified projects. But they, uh, they also bought Griffin Group, which is an 800-something acre training facility outside of Fayetteville. Uh, you can drive, you can jump, you can shoot, you can demo, you can riverine up. They've got lakes. Uh, they've expanded it. They have separate training facilities. Um, Robin Sage runs part of their training, you know, part of the exercise through Griffin Group's training facilities. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, so that's, that's cool. And that, that's, you know, I've been with those guys for, for 10 years. Um, but then, uh, then there's another company called uh, Tripwire and Tripwire is based in Gettysburg. And that's actually where I'm heading tomorrow night up to Gettysburg. And they do explosives. They'll do bulk explosives, C4, black powder, et cetera. But uh, they also design uh, munitions specifically for, for drones. Oh, okay. And uh, there's a, there's a couple of different, um, if you know, if you ever heard of Brett Barbie, Sure. He's one of our guys that, yeah, he's that went to here. the two, four. He, yeah. he, he's that, I just was with him at, at soft week yeah, uh, last dude. week. Awesome dude. And he's with a company called firestorm. That's uh, that's uh, led by a guy named Chad McCoy. Who's a PJ that was at the two, four. Okay. Um, but their munition is made by tripwire. And okay. so tripwire has been a client of mine for about five years. Um, so I think it's just cool. I, you know, again, yeah. going back to the, to the way life, works i've got all these dudes that i've known for a long time and now we're working together all of us so yeah, yeah. it just tells you you're on the right path i think yeah for sure or that's what yeah. it's, that's what it's saying to me anyway you know life's not without hardship i mean this coffee's been cold for an hour now I'm, but i'm fighting through it you know right. Look, I'm, not, I'm not no quitter yeah it's funny you mentioned yeah brett like i said brett's been on here uh, you, you mentioned juan he, he uh he told his story on here too you should check that one out if you get a chance I would love to, you dude. Probably one, know a lot of the uh, the things that he's talking about. I'm sure. I might. I can tell you, it's 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 uh, if, have you ever been in 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 the jock when there's a tick on and and they've got the pred porn no, going? I never and did. Never it. meant it. No, I never had that. Uh, never had to go do that. It stopped being cool when I realized who I was looking at because I'm like I'm like what what team is that? No, I just you know so I mean, that's what it was. I was like what what wait, wait what team is this? And they tell me. And I know Juan is there because I'm the one who can assign people, you know, because I'm I'm the Siege of Soda Velo, right? Right, right? Old Lieutenant Higgins here. 
and uh, and, and and then you, you're looking at it, and you, and you can tell because right? Juan's you know he's a short guy, yeah. And you see him drag; he's dragging dudes out of burning vehicles, and and he's all fucked up, and yeah, yeah. That's when that's when the, the red thing got uncool. I, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I talked to a lot of guys, and uh, like to your point, being in that jock, watching it go on is far worse than being on the ground oh, to yeah. an extent. You know what I mean? Obviously, you're not getting shot at, and you're not getting blown up. But it's like you just you feel so helpless. I would assume looking yeah. at that guy on the ground. Well, you know? especially right. So 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 the, the one saving grace is you're in the fight, right? I can push you. You know, behind me, I've got this whole whiteboard that you know we would track what's what's on, what's on station now, what the timeline, what's coming, what do we have for ground cast, what can we do, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Okay, when that's all gone, yeah. like I can't do anything for you. I can't right. magically shit out new planes. And that's the, that's the worst part is when you're in the fight, I can feel like I'm helping, right? Like I'm, I'm you know, load mags for you, so to speak. Right. I'm not right. shooting, nobody's shooting at me, but I can help you. But when that's all gone, dude, it, it is, it is, I mean, that is a, that's a miserable feeling, especially because the army's like air force. What do we got? And I'm like, mm, Jack and shit. Which one do you want? That's not good. Yeah. That had to be frustrating. So, yeah, but, Overall, I mean, it was a good time. I don't, I don't regret it. I have aches and pains every day. I, uh, I'm all, you know, like, like many, uh, breathing those uh, burn pits. I mean, batteries and poop and whatever else, you know, biohazard they were burning up there. Right. You know, that's in my lungs. Yeah. So that's that's not awesome. But I know. yeah, yeah. The same here. I, and I talked to a lot of guys that just we're all kind of dealing with it now. We're all getting reaching that point in our lives where it's all coming to a head, and we're like our knees are still, you know. Our knees are uh, worse. Yeah, how old are you? I uh, I turned fifty one this year, so okay, yeah. yeah. So we're the same age. So I'm I'm about a year older than you, right? Yeah. And you know when you stand on something uh, like a hard surface for a long time, your oh, feet yeah. just kind of ache. Yeah, okay. Well, that's how my feet feel when I wake up in the morning. The top, yeah. right? The tops of my feet feel. And there's times, my mom, you know, we're I don't know, we were at a gas station, me and my wife, and often I just laugh. And she says, "What's funny?" I said, "No, no, I think I just broke my ankle." And uh, if I, it, like I'm gonna cry or laugh, like I don't I don't get to choose. Just it happens, right? It it hurts so bad, and I have those phantom pains that just pop up like that. And yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, that's life. Yeah, right. I know. Yeah, so, but to, like I yeah. guess, kind of going back to what we were saying about those guys now, they're 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 making these new guys, or I don't know, making them, but they're they are. Is, ensuring that they don't go through the same stuff you know they're like they're being yeah, smarter I hope about so. the training i hope so building, building them yes. up like d1 athletes as opposed to just oh go ruck for 12 15 miles and you know there's no cool down there's right. no warm-up there's no you know recovery you know so hopefully they're doing a lot smarter now and guys that are going through it right now won't have to deal with the kind of stuff we're dealing with could be other stuff but well i mean you you hope it's you hope it's less right you hope that uh that that when their career is done yeah. You know, they'll have some wear and tear, but it's not, you just toss them in the discard pile. Right. Which I think a lot of us have. Been. Right. Exactly. Like, yep. Got everything I got out of that guy. There's nothing left. New guy. Come in. I hope that, I hope that it's different. And I do believe, I mean, it's, it's, you know, look, we, we you, you know, they're, they're expecting a lot out of our guys. Yeah. Why shouldn't they be in this world-class athlete? style where they've got 100%. you know human performance coaches they've got nutritionists they've got doctors at the units now you know physical therapists hey jimmy uh, twisted his knee on the on that last ruck uh, you know cross cross country okay let's get him in let's check it let's make sure let's not exacerbate it or turn it into a lifelong issue let's right. just fix it that's uh, you know wow that's it's like the v8 oh uh, why didn't i think of that because it costs money yeah. And now they're actually, you know, putting money towards it. So, and you're going right? to get that guy for a lot longer. You know, you can he's going to last longer than maybe we did. You know, like yep. some guys probably yeah. quit prematurely because, you know, they they had an injury and they couldn't figure out how to fix it, or they didn't build them up to where they could, you know, not sustain that injury in the first place. You know, I don't know. So yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, how many times? Uh, hey, you know, my PT and it, it is, my ankle hurts or whatever. Like, well, that's cute, but, you know, we're doing land nav today, so right. tighten your boot. Exactly. I mean, you know, or if you're the candy ass that went to sick call, 
Like, you, you know, I was never that guy because I, A, what are they going to do? They can tell me to take Motrin. Got it. Right. And B, it's going to take up the whole morning. And C, you're a pussy. Exactly. What are you doing? You were out training and you were, you, you, were, you, right. you were, yeah, you were getting your tampon changed and whatever. Right. So <laughs> knock right. it off. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And that's how that's, it was. Yeah. That mentality of, you know, just suck it up and drive on is yeah. it's commendable. I mean, I know a lot of guys that like, you know, jumped on a drop zones, broke their ankle, Charlie Mike the whole time. And, you know, oh, it's shit. like, but to what, what end, you know, to what, how did that end up for them? Yeah. If you're, if you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. Right. That's but, right. but now I think you're right. More, more to your point. I think, I think it, it is like a, a, you know, division one team, right? They're hey, yeah. coach, you know, I, I can't, I got to sit this next play out. Fine. Get over there, get healed up. Let's go. You know, because right. the work doesn't stop. You didn't do land nav today. Great. Guess what you're doing tomorrow? Land nav, right? I mean, think about, think about being an airman on active duty. Mondays, we're doing, you know, radio checks and we're doing PMCS on the, on the trucks that we never drive because we walk or jump everywhere. Uh, but, you know, we yeah. still have them. So guess what? Right? Go make sure they still work. Maintain them. Every Monday. Yeah. Every Monday, yeah. right? Well, when you're done with that, drive them. Okay. Well, yeah. you know, Monday's a holiday. Guess what we're doing Tuesday? And that's right. the beauty of active duty, but, but the mentality needs to be like, like we're seeing where they're like, Hey, listen, you're not going to get it all done today, especially with your foot all banged up. Go take care of it because you're no good to us hurt. Right. And you're even less good to us when that hurt doesn't go away. Exactly. Well, I, I like seeing that. I think that's a smart change. Oh, me too. Oh, for sure. You know, 100%. yeah. Well, dude, so, this has been great, man. This has been awesome. I, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Uh, I, I I say this to everybody, but I, I, it's true for everybody. These bios that I get to read and these these stories are just fascinating. And I, I can't thank you enough for sharing and, and uh, letting us know oh, about all this stuff, man. I really appreciate it. Man, I, I, I'm, I'm honored that you, uh, that you asked me to come on. Oh, I'm, for sure. I'm, this is, this is cool. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my, my time. I'm proud of being a romad. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, looking back, obviously, you know, I'm not that guy anymore. I can barely walk, say nothing about run, but, uh, you know, but, but, uh, but, but it's nice to, to, uh, to, to reminisce and to think about some of those things I haven't thought about in a long time. Yeah. And, uh, I know that, you know, my story is one of many, there's everybody, uh, shit, you know, Chris Pavlich, right. The, the Russian bear, that, that dude, that dude is a tank. He probably doesn't have any physical pains like I do, but you know, God, I mean, he came out of a, a I mean, under a canopy, just like I did, right? Just, yeah. hey, there's winds at altitude. I don't think so. Pav hit the PI. <laughs> like, yeah, it's Pav, right? right? Like, check a refrigerator out the door. See if that right. falls straight down. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just cool. I, I appreciate it. And, and, and you know, it, it is a small world. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've, I've known of you. Um, so it's nice to actually finally talk to you. Yeah, for sure. Same here. Yeah, I've heard a ton yeah. about you. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, it's just fascinating how you, your career progression. And, and of course I want to meet the guy in that video for sure. I've been, I've seen that. I saw that video two decades ago. And yeah. Yeah. Well, if you ever see that video again, and when you look through the pictures that I sent you, just know that in his left pocket are the teeth that came out of his head. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was a good, you know, it was good to send those home with him. Yeah. 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 I wonder. If- yeah. Like I said, very courteous yeah. of you. Very nice of you to. Well, you know, I am a gentleman, right? I'm an officer now. So I, you know, oh, I mean, sure, I was just yeah. in training. Yeah. That's oh, right. the officer and a gentleman, sir. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right, yeah. man. So well, again, awesome. I, I, thank I can't you. thank you enough. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks a lot for doing this. Absolutely.